So I'm going to assume we are live. This is Deacon Joseph Sweden. This is Hiram McKinnick. And um, this is Orthodox Apologetics Channel. We're live as we often are. Um, we're using a new service today. Um, we're using a service called StreamYard um, because we wanted to test it out. It looks like it has a lot of the features that Google Hangouts has, as well as a number of new features, which hopefully will make the show more interesting and will make it more visible in terms of how people watch it and more accessible. Um, so we can do all sorts of things now, like adding banners and things like that. So in any case, um, True Orthodoxy with all the wrinkles. I kind of wanted to give it a nicer title than Orthodox, True Orthodox Battle Royale um, because of the fact that basically, unfortunately, that's what we're going to be discussing. There's no doubt about that. Um, it's just that we want to, we, we always want to approach it as balanced as we can. And I think we've done that over, uh, how long have we been doing this now? Six months? Since last year, I think, right? Since last year, yeah. Since last summer, yeah. So we've been doing this about a year. So, I mean, you know, you guys can trust us to be fair and balanced, but, you know, obviously we're going to discuss things that are not always the most comfortable. And so this is a kind of an important, uh, kind of an important thing to, to talk about. So, uh, basically, the question is this. So you decided to become Orthodox. You realize you don't want to deal with ecumenism. You realize you don't want to deal with modernism, surgeonism. So uh, what do you do? Now, the easiest answer, of course, that we're going to give, because we're members of the same synod, is join us. Now, every other true Orthodox jurisdiction is going to have a disagreement with that and say, join us. And the question becomes, well, what do you do with that? And, you know... Why, you know, basically the pros and cons of, you know, this sort of thinking. And so, you know, we're, uh, we're going to, in this, you could almost say that this is probably, this is probably going to cover basically a good part of the history of true orthodoxy in the 20th century. Am I right? Yeah, sure. I believe so. Yeah. So, um, so one of the fun features that we now have are banners. So we're going to go through some of them. Um, Okay, so if we're talking about, you know what, we, we could use, uh, you know, we'll, we'll do a banner, because right now, the, the two biggest groups that you're going to talk about whenever you're talking about true orthodoxy, um, especially in Western countries, are true Orthodox, or the true orthodox Church of Greece and uh, the true orthodox of Russia. Because even though, yes, there are true orthodox in Romania and Bulgaria, um, outside of their home countries... There, it's, they don't have usually much of a presence outside of that. So you're really generally dealing with, uh, you know, Greek or Russian synods, or in our case, uh, we, you know, we're kind of a convert synod of uh, by ritual. We not by ritual. We use, you know, we'll use Western rites, Eastern rites. We're, you know, we're because we're a convert synod. It's a little bit different for us, and we'll go through our history in a little bit. But um, in any case, so I figure we could start. You, should we talk about like, you know, we could have, basically there's two ways we could start this. We could either talk about the True Orthodox Church of Greece to start, or we could talk about the Rokor and the aftermath and the Catacomb Church. Uh, which do you think uh, we should go with first, Father? Say, say that again. Uh, we could either ta start by talking about the True Orthodox Church of Greece or the True Orthodox Church of Russia, the Rokor, etc. I guess we might as well cover Greece because that's that's always going to be like that's going to be that's going to be a little bit a little bit more important to some extent. So let's cover Greece first. Okay, so we'll cover Greece. All right, so, you know, basically, so you, you're you about to join the True Orthodox Church of Greece, okay? And so you do that, and uh, so you say, okay, so where is the True Orthodox Church of Greece? You're going to find that there are two kinds of True Orthodox Churches of Greece as a general rule, and one of them is a lot bigger than the other, um, and those are the Florinites and the Matthewites. So let's start with the Florinites, shall we? Yeah, well, let's let's remember the the different the, well, how this all came about. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So basically, for about I don't know about 10, 12 years, uh, you had people who were calling who had formed associations of priests and clergy and laity in Greece in the nineteen twenties, oftentimes called like Association of the Genuine Orthodox Christians, and some and generally they were like non commemorators or they were people who refused to, even if they were commemorated, they would just simply refuse to use the new calendar. Uh, and they had a lot. Uh, so uh, there was a good dose of state persecution against them. And uh, then in 1935, the Masonic government, the Venezuela's liberal Masonic government was overthrown. 
and kind of the monarchy of the king came back. At that point, uh, a few bishops, uh, especially there was a Metropolitan Chrysostomus of Florina who was retired. There was a Metropolitan Germanus of Demetrius, who was like second in the hierarchy of the state church. And there was a Metropolitan Chrysostom, another Metropolitan Chrysostomus, I believe. Yeah. It was a Kinthos, I think. Yes. <laughs> and uh, they were like, well, you know, we're, we're basically going to take over leadership of the conservative uh, faction. Um, now, originally, there were going to be 16 other bishops or 16 bishops also coming with them all together. But they kind of like got scared of the last moment and decided not to go. So uh, these uh, so they formed basically what was called this, uh, the Synod of the Church, the Synod of the Genuine Orthodox Christians. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, they took the leadership of these people. And uh, that, and they constant in nineteen late, I think, in, and in that initially, uh, they began to put out statements to all the different Orthodox churches. They sent like declarations to Poland, to Antioch, to Jerusalem, to Alexandria. I think Alexandria had not ad accepted the old, the new calendar at the time. To Serbia, to all these other ones, saying that they were actually consider themselves in spiritual communion. There's actually documents you can find on this uh, with them. Um, and, uh, so then a, a little bit later after some of this happened in the end of, think, end of 1935, I believe they had con they consecrated four additional bishops mm -hmm. and it was, a, there was, a, there was the most famous one of these was Bishop Matthew of Brestina, but there was a, I think a Bishop Polycarp and I cannot for the life of me remember the other two who were consecrated. Uh, they, but they were like, they, didn't they, they eventually, they were God, well, yeah. they were auxiliary bishops, two of them. I think two or th maybe three of them eventually went back to the new calendar uh, church in like 1946 because they had been in, put in prison a few times. And they kind of like, well, this is, you know, they, they didn't want to be put in prison, I suppose. Although ironically, the new calendar church refused, to, uh, decided not to, um, not to reconsecrate them, which is kind of interesting as to why. But um, anyway, so that's, that's kind of how it began. Um, and in, however, what happens very early on, I think, I think I, I, my chronology might be a little bit off. I think in early 36, anyway, after they consecrated the auxiliary bishops, uh, Metropon Chrysostomus of Florina, who is sometimes considered, people kind of consider him like the leader, though technically he was really Metropon Germanus, of, of, it's Germanus Demetrius, correct? Uh, uh, yeah, he was, uh, he, and he, he was, was technically the first hierarch. Course. Well, he was technically their first hierarch, as I recall, because Chrysostomus was a retired metropolitan. Right. Uh, now, when and so what happens is uh, there's an, a, an Athenian newspaper is interviewing Metropolitan Chrysostomus of Florina, uh, and in the interview, the, the discussion happens about well, do, does the New Calendar Church have grace or not? Are their sacraments valid? Do they are they valid grace filled? Or are they not grace filled? And uh, Metropolitan Chrysostomus says something like, well, uh, he considered that he considered them potentially schismatic. But not actually schismatic, and uh, so this creates a firestorm among at least some of the um, true Orthodox in Greece, saying that this is incorrect, this is not consistent. He, he should, and uh, Bishop Matthew of uh, Brestina, who is the auxiliary bishop, basically, and his his people break away, saying that Chrysostomus of Florina had fallen into heresy. Yeah, right? and they be, and he begins to be referred to as a former bishop by them. Yes, and now Mitch von Germanus of Demetrius does not agree with this either, and he actually separates after a little bit of time too from Chrysostomus. That's not well known. Um, and he he eventually, I think he has to, ha uh, I think he um, has some sort of relationship with Bishop Matthew, like communion agreement. But then they get an argument because I think Bishop, because uh, what happens is Mitch von Germanus accuses Bishop Matthew of teaching some kind of heresy. Where he taught that if Saint John Chrysostom hadn't come about, then there would have to be a second incarnation. And the Matthewites always say this is a misunderstanding. We deny it, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but they don't. I'm not exactly sure what was said. And then in turn, Matthew, Bishop Matthew accuses Germanus Demetrius of teaching the broken teeth heresy. Um, and so uh, I don't know if you have heard of the broken teeth heresy, Father Joseph. Uh, I'm sure our, our viewers haven't. And... Broken the broken teeth heresy. See. I think there was some sort of devotional book that Germanus or Demetrius or a sermon he had published in which he said that, you know, uh, in which there was some kind of speculation that maybe Christ had had a tooth knocked out of his mouth or something like that, 
or somebody, or, 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 or was that Germanus would not deny, would not say it was dogmatic that Christ had not lost any teeth. And Matthew was saying that the scripture says not a, not a bone of his shall be broken. Therefore, the teeth are part of the bones. Therefore, if Christ, if you, if you believe Christ lost a teeth, a tooth, I'm sorry, uh, you know, by being tortured or hit, beat, then you're teaching uh, heresy. So they kind of separate. But then, like, by 1939 or 40, everybody kind of gets back together except for Matthew, as I understand. Yeah. Um, and and uh, Chrysostomus is like, well, I won't make any more controversial public statements, and I'll sign, you know, these documents saying the new calendarists don't have grace. I mean, I don't want to cause any more problems. I didn't mean, you know, et cetera, et cetera, you know. Uh, so that's kind of how it continues. Then in 1947, I believe, in 48, Bishop Matthew was convinced um, – either has been convinced or is convinced uh, that he is either the only bishop left in Greece or he's the only bishop left in the world or he's the only bishop in Greece and no one in the world wants to help him or something like that. And he decides, it, it, well, it's close. He it's closer to the, the only bishop left in Greece because he does, he did actually, I know that this was exposed mm -hmm. with the Matthew Ed archives that he did actually attempt to reach out to supposedly uh, he sent letters to Serbia too, or something yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but they couldn't um, do anything. So. Yes. Supposedly, St. Nikolai Velomirovich was friendly and to the old calendars and St. Chrism. I've heard that repeated numerous times. I mean, sometimes the new calendars deny it, but then sometimes when they want to attack the old calendars, they will affirm it because it looks looks supposedly looks bad for us, I guess, or whatever. Um, so he then does a single-hand uh, consecration, that is a, a one bishop making another bishop. And I, I don't really, Euthymius, I can't remember the name of the, the, fellow, the Michael, I can't remember the fellow who was done this, uh, made by him. And uh, then the next day they make more bishops and so-and-so because then he has two bishops or whatever. Well, wh what happens is uh, a number of clergy who were associated with the Matthewites began to think, sorry, my dog's barking. Uh, the no number of clergy who were associated with the Matthewites uh, begin to uh, say, that, well, this is not acceptable. Um, you know, there's really not a, a strong justification for single-hand consecration. Uh, and, for example, they just simply leave. Like Archbishop Axentius, the first hierarch of the... Of the uh, uh, Foreign Church, Church, was originally a Matthewite yeah, also. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, he was, in fact, a Matthewite uh, priest in Chicago, believe it or not. Uh, he ha actually ran a church in Chicago in the 1930s. I had no idea. That's actually, uh, yeah, that's that's actually well. rather interesting because, in fact, old calendars, Greek old calendars were actually the bigger, were actually a significant or even majority back in the 30s in, in America. There weren't that many Greeks in America, you know what I mean? But they actually were, there were a lot more of them than people think. Um, but, you know, however it happened to them, I don't want to get involved in that issue. But anyway, so... Now, uh, uh, Sean, Sean asks about the, I believe, about the broken teeth. He, he says, was that over a supposed relic or something? No, no. Okay, see, Matthew, Bishop Matthew was saying that the prophecy in Isaiah, as I believe, is not, or is it Isaiah or is it Psalm 22? I think it's, is it Psalm, is it Psalm yeah. 21? I can't, I, I can't let remind not, no, Let not one of his bones be exactly. broken. Exactly. It's saying that none of his bones shall be broken. There's a prophecy about Christ in the Old Testament, all right? And uh, because we don't believe Christ had any of his bones broken. So Matthew was saying that the teeth are Psalm part 30, of Psalm 3420. Pardon me? Psalm 34. Psalm thirty four. Okay, he protects all, all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Yeah, exactly. Is that that's the uh, that's the substitution numbering, correct? Um, it has to be no. Psalm, Psalm thirty three. It wouldn't be Psalm thirty three. Yeah. Okay. So Matthew's point was that the teeth he he regarded as part of the bone. Therefore, he did not view it as acceptable to say Christ could have lost teeth naturally or by any other manner. And so he regarded you as a heretic if you taught that Christ. Lost, lost teeth. Okay, right? so that's that's kind of I don't. To me, it's like a ridiculous thing to to make up as a heresy. I mean, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. But anyway, um, that's and they don't really Matthewites don't really talk about it a lot. In fact, I confronted a few of them years ago about this, and like you don't understand. It's you know we don't talk. It, it's it, it's more complicated than that. And anyway, but um, one thing you'll hear in a lot of these arguments between true Orthodox is it's more complicated than that. Just okay. uh, in advance. Notice. Well, it, well, again, it may be it, it, anyway. But the I'm not saying that they're right. I'm just saying yeah. I hear them. You, you'll yeah, hear. No, them I understand. Lot, so, so, um, so anyway, um, and of course, you know, Germanus, you know, Demetrius, he didn't like Matthew. He thought, you know, this guy is crazy. He's just making stuff up. You know, all this up. You know, and, and Matthew Watch will hear me say that and like, how dare you? You know, but I'm just explaining what each side said about the other, just so people understand. 
Okay, so now at this so, point, so so that that happens. The Matthew Whites make bishops at that point. By 1947, 48, the Florinites, who are like 90, 95 percent of all who consider themselves true Orthodox in Greece, essentially they're about 13 percent of the population, or 14 percent. The Matthewites still make up more than they probably make up less than one percent of the total Greek population. At that point, uh, the the Florinites only have two bishops left, as I recall. Yeah. By 1950, there's a uh, Chrysostomus and Germanus. All right. Uh, because you know the other ones have either died or two of them went back to the two or three of them went back to the state church of Greece, and you know after an immense pressure they were put under house arrest and they were made to sign documents or something like that. Okay? Yeah. So Chrysostomus at this time is like exiled various times, as I recall, to different Greek islands. Um, uh, at one point he makes a trip to Jerusalem to try to get some support from the patriarch of Jerusalem, and it is they're like friendly, but they're kind of non-committal, if you know what I mean. Right. Uh, and so he comes back. Um, the Matthewites also began to attack Chrysostomus of Flinner at, in the 19, late 1940s because they accused him of being pro-Soviet and pro-communist, mm -hmm. which is an exaggeration. But what really was said, uh, what was really said, is that Ma Chrysostomus of Florina had said, um, under under the influence, believe it or not, of Allied propaganda, which was almost one of the same with Soviet propaganda at the time, because you know the Germans occupied Greece, so Chrysostomus was not going to be in friendly terms with the country that occupied his country. Uh, Chrysostomus of Florina is, is accused by the Matthew Whites to have said that, well, Stalin, you know, maybe he's actually, he's letting the church come back and, you know, uh, the Russians are getting more religious and there's freedom to the, to the church. And maybe he's, maybe Stalin, you know, and Stalin also made abortion illegal and he made divorce harder to get. He like strengthened the family laws, which Lenin had, had not, had basically torn down. And so Chrysostomus made kind of like statements like that, like, you know, maybe Russia is kind of returning. You know, and now before people accuse or throw Chrysos Metropolitan Chrysostomus of Florina under the bus, people in like the, the Rokor bishops, almost all the Rokor bishops, like in China and the Far East, believe the exact, exact thing, same thing was happening, except for um, the future Metropolitan Philaret. Uh, even St. John Maximovich, for like at least a few months, commemorated the Patriarch, uh, the so called Patriarch of Moscow, because they believe this stuff. All right. But then after after a bit of time, people begin to realize this is not not really the case. All yeah. right. And so I think something happened similar to Chrysostomus of Florina, but the Matthewites are like, oh, he's he's really a, he's a, a Soviet stooge. He, you know, if he didn't lo lose grace before, he lost grace then when he said this stuff or whatever. So, um, but in this time, Chrysostomus is like being tortured. I mean, essentially being like being tortured, not in physical in the sense of being beaten, but like shifted back and forth from monasteries to islands. And he's like an old man at this time, you know. Um, I, I think he's what is an eighty eighties or something like that. Yeah. And uh, they're and the, the state church and the Greek authorities are hoping they can somehow just wear him down to the point where, where he'll be like, I guess, you know, uh, I might as well give up. And what happens is in like 1948, when the uh, Western powers arrange for the election of uh, uh, Thinagoras, because remember, Athenagor I think it's Athenagoras becomes Patriarch of Constantinople in 1948. He flies back on Harry Truman's like personal airplane or something yeah. like that. Um, Athenagoras had, in fact, been ordained a deacon by Chrysostomus of Florina and have been the deacon of Chrysostomus of Florina um, originally. I thought they were related. Well, they may have, they may, he may have been like a, a you know, a great, a great, a great yeah. uncle or something like that. Not, I don't know about that, but he had been his actual deacon. And, and, and so what happens is Chrysostomus, uh, Athenagoras is like, you know, you know, come back to us, please. We'll make arrangements, whatever. We can fix this situation. Um, you know, just, you know, I, you know, because I guess he still had a personal attachment to him. And Chrysostomus of Florina was like, well, look, I cannot, as long as these issues against modernism, this modernist issue, you know, the calendar, and there's other, there are other modernist things coming in, as long as this has not been solved, if I were to join the ecumenical patriarch again, patriarchate, it would be a false union. All right? Because remember, Florina was in northern Greece, which was technically under the ecumenical patriarchate. All right? Um, so he had, he had originally been made a bishop of the ecumenical patriarchate back in like in 1908 or 1907 or something. So uh, the fifth, everything kind of drags on into the 50s. The uh, old calendarists uh, are still continuing to be persecuted. Um, you know, there was this one thing that happened like in 1946 where actually the communists, or 45, some of the communist Greek partisans like killed like five or six Matthew, like killed a bunch of Matthewites. Uh, the Matthewites talk about this. I mean, you know, that's horrible. Uh, and so that may explain why they were less forgiving about anything Chrysostomus of Florina would say, if you know what I mean, even if he would retract it later, because their view is, oh, you know, he supported people who were supporting people who killed our people. 
Um, so in the early 50s, as I recall, Germanus dies. At that point, um, Chrysostomus of Florian is like by himself. Um, he's like too old to really do anything. Um, obviously, he can't make bishops at this point, or if he does, he'd be putting himself in the same position that he criticized Matthew for being in. Um, and there are various appeals made to, I think, other Orthodox churches to help. And it's the same old story. People are sympathetic. They would like to help, but they are afraid, they're afraid to get in trouble. It's like, you know, Archbishop, um, you can read the uh, account that Archbishop um, Averki of Jordanville says about Archbishop Leonti and Archbishop Seraphim. He says that, you know, he, 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 was, he was happy that they helped consecrate bishops for the Florinites in 62, and he supported them, but he said he never personally would have done it. Because he just would, he did not want to handle the out the uh, the fallout from it. All right, so that's kind of the the continuing story. Now, supposedly, I, again, I, I say supposedly because it's very difficult to get a hold of all these documents or translations of them. There is supposed to have been a document that Metropolitan Chrysostom of Florina issued, or in 1955, saying that you know, since they're going to have no bishop after him, they might want to consider going under the Matthewites, provided the Matthewites seek to find some sort of canonical regularization of their situation from another Orthodox synod. Uh, and that, and so, now, interestingly, after around the same time, the Matthewites themselves make a statement saying that even though they accepted their consecrations in 48 or 47 as canonical, they are willing to accept some sort of supplementary right done upon them just for the sake of peace. All right. Uh, now, obviously, uh, the majority of the Florinites are like, well, we're not going to do that, even though Mitchell and Chrysostomus gave it to us as an option, because, you know, then we'd have, you know, 95% submitting to the 5%. And they already have, and a lot of these people are already left the Matthewites over this stuff to begin with. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's just not feasible from, a, uh, from that perspective. And so there are various. There are various authors. I know there was a um, uh, an Anastasius Hudson uh, who wrote a, I think, I wrote a book where he he says he was in the Rush in the in the Rokor Har archives, and he says he found documentation that supposedly Saint John Maximovich had actually uh, kind of interceded on the behalf of the Florinites to make bishops uh, in the 1950s, and and a minute, and you know, and the Rokor at that point didn't really want to do anything, mostly because of Metropolitan Anastasi. So then we come to what we come to 1962. Um, 1962 comes around, and there are two. Ro there were three Rokor bishops who agree to act not just to be sympathetic or to give support, but to actually participate in consecrations for bishops for the 95% of the old calendarists who don't have bishops. The they are Florines, yes. They are the they are um, Archbishop Chrysos. I mean, I'm sorry, Archbishop uh, Seraphim of Chicago, uh, Archbishop Leonti of Chile, and the Romanian New Calendarist bishop under Rokor, Bishop Theophan Unescu. Of all people, you'd think, right? Um, so what happens is, uh, I believe it's a It was an Archimandrite, Acacius Talantian or Talantian. Acacius of Talantia of Talantian was the first bishop. Yeah. Okay, uh, he's of Talantia. Okay, I'm sorry. So he goes to Detroit, and the and Detroit is where the Romanian um, New Calendar Bishop uh, Theophan Unescu has his cathedral. And now there at that time there was a Romanian diocese under Rocor. All right. And Theophan UNESCO had been made a bishop of the Romanian Patriarch back in the 40s or something like that. But he, yeah, kind of, the, he was the really anti UNESCO was an interesting character. Yeah, but, yeah, and yeah, it, it does we'll figure get, later in the history. Exactly. And, he, and the Matthew Whites will always bring bring up stuff about him. Uh, but he had been really anti communist, even though he went along with the new calendar. He didn't really seem to care that much about the new calendar, you know, but he's just like, okay, whatever. But he went along with it and um, and he was like really anti communist. So that's kind of like he, he left Romania. And uh, and all the rest, you know. So uh, the Rocor took him in. He's a Romanian New Calendarist bishop using the New Calendar under Rocor, and so he says, he tells Archbishop Seraphim, "Look, you can use my cathedral." And uh, I think it was like on a weekday, like a Friday or a Saturday. It, it wasn't on a Sunday, but it was on some other day. Uh, they decide to do the consecrations, and so Archbishop Seraphim, I mean, and um, Archbishop Seraphim and Bishop, and the Romanian New Calendar bishop Theophan Unescu. Uh, uh, together consecrate uh, Acacius. Um, and then later that year, uh, Archbishop Leonti of Chile flies to Greece 
to assist Akakius to help consecrate another bishop. And then I think he con I think Archer Exentius, the future Exentius, is the second person consecrated. I think. Yeah, they consecrated six bishops at that time. Yes, so they consecrate. I am assuming they do it in six successive days, but they you consecrate right. six bishops. Um, I mean, theoretically, once you consecrate, once you have four bishops, you could break up into two different churches in any way. But um, you know, two different consecrations with two different bishops. Anyway, right. but um, so uh, then they have a hierarchy back. However, at this point, the Roker is like, well, we never approved this officially. We can't, we can't, we don't, we can't recognize anything. All right. And um, however, Archbishop Seraphim and Archbishop Leonti or or Bishop Theophon Unescu are not punished. Uh, I don't know if Mitchell and Anastasi censured them, but you know, in some kind of personal way, but nothing's. Nothing is done to them, if you know what I mean. They're not yep. deposed or suspended or whatever. So at that point, the Florentines have their own uh, synod. Now, the problem was that there was some issue with the consecration certificates, all right, um, about they didn't really want to tell who had actually done the consecrations, I guess. In it, was, the it was the Theophilus UNESCO problem. Exactly. They were embarrassed that it was a Romanian new calendarist bishop who is he, I'm not he may if it was his cathedral I don't know if he wasn't the chief consecrator or the, I'm not I don't even no, know I, about I, that. well it, if I remember correctly um and this is again this comes from correspondence between uh, Archbishop Seraphim and um, Bishop Archbishop Accentius um basically uh I don't believe uh one of the Roquor bishops and I think it might have been Archbishop Seraphim signed the document. Yeah. And so what ends up happening because it was that was done privately, he admits to doing it. Mm -hmm. Um and it actually becomes a point of contention between the Florinites and the Matthewites later um over who was on the certificate and who consecrated who. And uh, Archbishop Accentius actually writes a letter to Archbishop Seraphim in which Archbishop Seraphim famously responds to him uh, to the effect that uh, you've spent so much time attacking the canonicity of the Matthewites consecrations, even after our correction, that perhaps this was brought upon you yourself. Well, it's inter it's, so it's interesting. Uh, of course, everybody acknowledges the consecrations actually happened. And I mean, that's not disputed by anybody who has any historical knowledge. You can, you know, rope or acknowledge it happened, etc. Yeah. But at, at the point, at that point, you have the you have Archbishop Acacius with a with a consecration certificate with just a Romanian new calendar bishop as the only signature. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that's what happened, actually, right? Yeah, and then there, there was... It, it and was then Seraphim happened. didn't want to sign it at the moment, even though he confirms it later. So then it looks like... Then then it looks like they have an even worse situation than the Matthewites. You know, it's yeah. a Romanian new calendar is doing a single-hand consecration, supposedly. Yeah, and the uh, Matthewites had a field day with that. Exactly. Then it's like, you know... And then they're like, well, who... who you know, et cetera, et cetera, you know? Because the Matthewite position, I think, would have been that, well, Theophan Unescu was consecrated in the Romanian Patriarchate, uh, he had no grace when he was consecrated. He was apostate, heretic, schismatic, et cetera, et cetera. All right. It's worth noting that right now, in Rome, at this time in Romania, old calendars were basically living in caves. Exactly. Yes. So, I mean, they may have brought that up. That you know, you went to this guy when he was, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Although it would be wrong to say Theophan Unesco was a supporter yeah, of the Romanian can't patriarch. Yeah, you blame to him for. I it. mean, he, he he wasn't a supporter of the Romanian patriarch. He used the new calendar and such, but he was not a he was not a supporter of the patriarch. I mean, he was he was anti communist. I mean, yeah. he did. Etc. I mean, he was more or less like a, what's his name, that other Romanian bishop who kind of went to exile um, in America, and you know I can't remember his name, but um, anyway, uh, so uh, not the no, no, Ed, Ed, that's Albanian. Sorry, no, he no, he was he was this other Romanian, famous Romanian uh, uh, a priest, and he he was consecrated by somebody in the United States, and then he was he was ended up they were going to deport him to Romania back in the late sixties or seventies. Um, his, his diocese later became part of the OCA Romanian Episcopate or something like that. Okay. But and like and then he famously they were going to deport him to Romania because he had been part of the Iron Guard and they were going to execute him. And um, and as he got on the airplane to fly to um to Portugal, I'm sorry, side story. He made the comment that uh, you know, they they said, "Aren't you an, a a flagrant anti-Semite?" You know, ex your eminence or whatever. And he says, "I am not an anti-Semite. I have never said anything against the Arabs." Anyway, so he, then he dies in Portugal. Anyway, another issue. So, um, anyway, so what happens is um, 69 rolls around, 1969. Uh, a change in the Roquor hierarchy has somewhat happened. Uh, after Anastasius dies, they elect the newly consecrated Bishop Philaret, who had only been made bishop like, I don't know, six a year like, earlier. 
Mm -hmm. And he's like a compromised candidate because supposedly, according to some histories, one one candidate was St. John Maximovich, and the other candidate was, I don't know, Archbishop Anthony or I'm not, of, of, of Geneva or something like that. I, I, it was very different, different. Anyway, and so they chose they choose the new guy, uh, Bishop Philaret, as kind of you know the compromise candidate. So anyway, he becomes Metropolitan, and it's at that point Roker begins to take on what we might call a definitive, uh, a more definitive stance on a lot of issues. All right, and uh, in 1969, the Roker Synod votes to retroactively uh, recognize, or you might say just recognize to begin with. Uh, that the consecrations that had happened in 1962 in Detroit uh, were valid, were canonical, all right? That they actually, grace actually, you know, there was actually real consecrations happened there. Although I've run into a few, one or two Florinites on the internet who say, oh, no, the grace only came to the to our bishops in 1969 or something like that when the rope will recognize it or whatever. Anyway, um, but uh, so at that point, they established communion with then Archbishop Arxentius of Athens and the uh, Floridite uh, Orthodox uh, Church or True Orthodox Church of Greece. At that point, um, Rokor had already taken in back in '66 or '67 um, Holy Transfiguration Monastery from the Greek Archdiocese. Uh, and every, as everyone knows, Holy Transfiguration Monastery had originally been um, a, a monastery of the Greek Archdiocese, but um, after Father, Father Pantelaimon started to be investigated, they kind of decided to leave, and then they joined Rokor. And then at HTM, there is some sympathy for some of the Matthewites, and so they began to engage in correspondence uh, or as uh, mediators, am I, if I'm correct here, Father Joseph, between the Rokor Synod and the Matthewites. Uh, no, that, that's correct. Actually, I remember there was a um, there was a review of sorts written uh, by Father Pantelaimon mm -hmm. of... Um, a, the various old calendarist groups, and he's pretty much disparaging to all of the Florinites at that point. I, and I think Father Anthony Gavalis was like, when, was he was alive at the time, wasn't he, as a priest? Yes. I think he was involved in it, because Father, An Father Anthony later became a bishop in the Matthewites. You know, and he, well, one he, of the things that happened yeah. is that many parishes came from the Greek Archdiocese to Rokor, and what would happen is um, HTM kind of shepherded them in, but they had their own ulterior motive for it. Um, oh, I know. I mean, the majority of the, I, I think, obviously, the majority of the, these parishes that left the Greek Archdiocese to join Rokor obviously did it for what they believe were sincere uh, yeah, no, doctrinal was, reasons. Was, they weren't that doing the it. Second, that, the yeah. second wave. Um, yeah. That was, you know, the, the wave after Vatican II when ecumenism kind of became, you know. Yes, really and so that introduces what? That introduces a large Greek element to Rokor, which then can act as an intermediary. So Father Pantelaim and HDM initially don't like the Florinites, but I guess they accept it as a fait accompli because Rokor is in communion with them. And at that point, they began to interact between the Matthewites, and who I guess was it Archbishop Nicholas or Andreas? I can't remember who was the Archbishop at the time of the Matthewites. And um, yeah, I think it was I think it was Archbishop yes. Andreas. And now there's another interesting, um, interesting letter uh, in which either then Father George Grave or someone else in the Rocor Chancellery says something like, "Well, uh, theoretically, we could accept." The seeing when hand consecrations as done, you know, that you, you thought these circumstances were this and that, you know what I mean, that kind of stuff. But the conclusion was that if we just receive you by like a confession of faith or something like that, it's just going to cause too many problems. And the, and the, and the, and the Florines began to say, no, 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 you cannot do this. You have to give them either consecrate them whole new again or give them care to see it. All right. Well, that, now that's an interesting point because they actually, the Royal Court Synod, it's pretty much undoubted that they gave them a Caritasia, but um, many people uh, began to, in, among the Florida... In 1971. It happened yeah, in 1971. That was in 1971. At HTM by Archbishop Philotheos of Hamburg and Archbishop Constantine of Sinsky. Yes, but my point was that uh, others began to accuse the Matthewites of ha getting a Caritonia, a complete consecration, well, and so they weren't bishops at all. Well, this is, this is, this is, the, this is the whole... Con see, this is... Now, this is what I, I, I've, I've heard from one or two people, this is, of course. Now this becomes, uh, you know, what you heard as an anecdote, so believe it for what it is. No, 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 I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about in publications they actually. Oh no, no, no! But but here, but this is the dispute, because generally when heretasia is given by heretasia, we don't mean the minor orders, because oftentimes we use heretasia to refer to minor orders. Heretasia in this sense is almost like conditional ordinate or confirmatory, right. where the ordination prayers are read over someone again. Generally, when that's done, like before the before the liturgy begins, like during the hours or the you know or generally theoretically before the hours. 
Uh, the person who is going to have care to see you has a canonically suspect coordination. They would kneel down, kneel down at the altar, and the canonical bishop would lay his hands uh, and his amaphor on, and he would, let's say, if it was a deacon, he would read the prayer for reader, then subdeacon, then deacon. If he was right. a priest, he would all the way up to priest, and if it was a bishop, all the way up to bishop. Okay. Um, now, the problem is that people say that what happened at HTM was something kind of in between because they were allowed to vest on all their vestments, but they could not put on the armor or their mitre. And then they were allowed to enter the sanctuary or come into the church, I mean, I mean, into the, the holy place at the, the point where, I guess, at the Trisagion, I, I, at the point where a bishop is consecrated or something. And then Archbishop Philotheos and Archbishop Constantine uh, read the prayer over the first bishop. And then he put the um, Amalfour on them, and then they can celebrate. And then the next day they did it for the next bishop. Okay. Uh, now the problem with this is that when when Metrop when Metropolitan Callistos and I can't remember the name of the uh, Bishop Epiphany, I think, or something, the yeah. other Matthew White Bishop came back. They were supposed well, to do it for everyone. Yeah, but here's what happened: they went into they all the Matthew White Bishops knelt down during the hours after there's I guess it was a period after Orthros and before liturgy they were singing the hours. And they all knelt down around the holy table, and all that Metropolitan Callistos did was read the prayer of absolution that's contained, you know, after confession over them. Okay. And so this that's the dispute of you know, why did they do that? And one theory is that nobody was really being uh, quite clear or sincere in what the other party was expecting to actually happen. And that is that they that the Callist, Callistos and Epiphanes maybe they got to HTM, and they were convinced to accept this kind of very full version of the Caritasia, almost a Caritonia or appearance of of such. And they didn't they shouldn't have done it. And then when they go back to Greece, they're like, well, if we try to tell everybody we got to do this to them, they're not going to accept it. All right. And so then they kind of just read absolution prayers over them. Well, I mean, there, you, know, there, you see my point. Yeah. My point is, and the problem is that then you know the argument is that. The Matthewites will say that when Archbishop Andreas visited HTM, he was allowed by Metropolitan St. Philip to say the blessing at one of the table dinners. And the Matthewites thereafter claimed that Rokor was received into the true church. This is what the Kyraclites at least claim. Uh, once Archbishop Andreas said the blessing, like there was like, I don't know how that makes any sense, but anyway, I've heard yeah, well, that. Yeah, that, well, yeah, that, that actually became their argument for a while until Kyraclites left the Senate. Um, but so what we'll do they claim that now? when we get to Matthew White groups, uh, okay. we're still so anyway. That's so Rokes, the frame. okay. So here's the problem. So, this is a complicated history. I mean, and for people who don't like true orthodoxy, thinking this is all, intri all intricate, well, this is unfortunately how church history oftentimes operates. Um, so what happens is ostensibly there is a communion established between the Matthew Whites with Rokort and the Floridites with Rokort. Now, at that period, Rokor encourages the Florentines and the Matthewites to seek a full communion with each other. And there are letters exchanged between the two parties in which they talk about my most dearly beloved brother in Christ. Yeah, like for about four or five years, yeah. Exactly. And I think they actually did have some kind of celebrations transpire. I don't know how, how prominent there were. Someone might contradict me on that. But they did exchange letters calling each other brother consolidate and such and brother in Christ. So if they thought each other were heretic schismatics, I can't imagine they would have done that. Yeah. Uh, so then what happens is 1975 rolls around. Uh, the Matthew Whites begin to feel uncomfortable with certain things they're seeing going on in Rokor Europe, which has always been the problem. Uh, Archbishop Anthony of Geneva, who was kind of like, you might call the liberal of Rokor. He was like the biggest ecumenist. Of yeah, world. he was originally a Moscow Patriot, but he went he joined the Moscow Patriot from like 1946 to 48, and then he suddenly decided to join Rokor or something. Anyway, that's, that's Vladimir Moss's view is that he was like, isn't that kind of convenient, you know? Maybe he was an agent. But anyway, um, he was always very pro-MP, pro-world orthodox. He did, um, you know, he, he was conservative in the sense of, you know, he was anti-communist, supposedly. But he, was you know? also, he was also celebrating with new calendars and often. Yeah, and he never stopped that. Even, yeah, calendars. exactly. And even after Rokor had made, had made like a point of kind of privately telling their bishops not to do this and then and, and all the rest, he kind of continued to do it. And so... Uh, Matthew White uh, priests in uh, in Greece um, were were being attacked by like there was a Serb there was this one Serbian hieromonk I can't remember his name on Mount Athos that was attacking the the true Orthodox of Mount Athos saying that well I just went you know if you know I just can celebrated with uh, the Rokor bishops and the Matthew Whites didn't like that obviously and so they kind of write to find out what's going on 
and uh, and then it's like you know Archbishop Anthony. Uh, supposedly there's one story. I, I, this is again anecdotal that that supposedly uh, one of the an old calendarist uh, priest showed up. I'm not maybe a Matthew White in Geneva to celebrate with Archbishop Anthony, and at the same time. Anthony knew what was happening, and he invited like a, a Greek archdi, a, 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 a ecumenical patriarch priest to celebrate with him at the same time, or something like that, you know. And that's kind of a story. But whatever happened, you know, almost as a point to kind of like to say he doesn't like them, and that he's going to force them to do something they don't want to like or make them leave the church, you know. So what it, whether that happened or not, what happens is the Matthew Whites in nineteen seventy four or seventy five write a letter to the Rocour Chancery, which is which ninety second Street, ninety third Street, whatever, mm -hmm. which the remember the name of the street in New York City. And uh, what happens is they say that what is the position of Rokor uh, on the new calendar churches? Yeah. And I think they may even say the other patriarchates or something too. In the re reply, the official reply given back by Father George Grabe, who later would be Bishop Gregory Grabe, is that Rokor does not believe the, the Rokor, this is uh, the official reply is Rokor believes the new calendar church New calendar is a grievous error, and, and it condemns and or censures modernism and ecumenism, but it does not believe that it has the authority to declare uh, any of the patriarchates or the new calendarists to have not do not have grace. That we don't, we may avoid concelebrating with them, but we don't use this as some sort of a doctrinal issue or something like that. All right, uh, and of course that that basically ends the communion, if you know what I mean, uh, between yeah, the Matthewites and the Rocor. It's, it's over. It's over with that. The Matthewites and the Rocor. So, in other words, the basically four-year communion was, to some extent, did it exist as only as a result of negotiations between HTM without with them not telling both parties what the other party believed? That's almost what it seems. Uh, there well, was some keep in mind it's uh, that this is 1975 or 1976 or so, but it's only like a couple of years later that um, that uh, Father Yao Rocha ends up becoming uh, ends up being not only rebaptized rechristmated reordained by archbishop Accentios of the Florinites, mm -hmm. but he actually makes him bishop of Portugal. Well this uh, is the problem because Father Father Zhao the Father Zhao what's your pronounce Father Zhao or I don't know what what's Yao, the I was gonna say Yao but what's the Anglicization of that? John? Uh, John. Okay. So he had originally been a Roqua priest ordained by Archbishop Anthony of Geneva. But I, I, Archbishop, but he had, but he had been baptized in the Roman Catholic, the Roman Church. Catholic Church, yeah. And I don't know if Anthony even chrismated him, but he took him in and he made him a priest. Uh, and that apparently, I guess the Father John had complaints. He had something he didn't like that eventually, or people were saying his baptism was invalid, etc. And there was some issue about him trying to convert people from Roman Catholicism to Orthodoxy, and there were complaints to Anthony of Geneva that you have a priest causing problems among the, you know. Anthony yeah, Geneva, was some, Roman Catholic exactly, like exactly. So he was like, "Oh, I don't want this problem." Because remember, Anthony Geneva was the one who went to the who went to the Vatican II Council as the supposed Rocor yeah. observer, mm -hmm. and he exactly. processed in with the Moscow Patriarchate. He got censured for that, but they never really did anything else to him. Um, so in any case, so this. this so what happens is that he then he then turn, yeah. So Father John Rao then turns to uh, our, the True Orthodox Church of Greece, and he's like, "This is the situation," and they're kind of shocked uh, by it. You know, I guess they're, you know, and so they basically baptize him and chrismate him and they ordain him. And, you know, Arch An Anthony was like, this is a great insult to him. He thought he was, you know, very, you know, made him a bishop, he, and after he made him a bishop, basically, Rocor broke communion with the Florinites. That was like in 1978 or 79, yeah, I think. 79. 79, 79, I believe. Okay. Okay. It was 1979. Um, and so, you know, that's that, that ends that. Now, whether you agree with what happened or not, the point is, is that, you know, there was. This all kind of the, kind of a lot of the centers around Archbishop Anthony of Geneva in terms of that's he was the one like the liberal causing all the problems in Rocor for a long time, you know. So then the communion with the Florinites ends. Um, now it's worth I, noting that this that the the this um, the bishop that uh, Archbishop Oxentius made uh, would eventually uh, well, well we'll get to that six years. Yes, from okay, now. yes, because it's important. So back to Greece. Um, so what happens? Uh, is a few years, like two years early, 1977 or 78, the Metropolitan Thessalonica, uh, Chrysostomos uh, Cusis, uh, is uh, suspended by the Synod uh, because they accuse him of uh, concelebrating with or taking communion with a Jerusalem patriarchate clergy without the permission of the Synod. Um, and uh, Archbishop Exentius is like, I don't know what his views personally were, but his view was that you can't do this if we're not technically in communion with them officially. And so Metropolitan 
Chrysostomos uh, is like, I don't accept this, you know, and uh, he kind of gathers a few people around him who um, are in opposition to Archbishop Exentius. Right. Because they say he's taking people in from the new calendarists who are bad people or he's not investigating sufficiently or something like that. So their view is that they don't like people he's ordaining and therefore they think this gives them justification for breaking communion with him, which is technically you cannot do according to Canon 15 for a second council. It's only for, for dogmatic issues you can do that. Meanwhile, Metropolitan uh, Callistus of Corinth. Uh, okay, yes. Let's okay. Let's get to that. So the two Matthew this is all White, happening at the same time. Exactly. This is why it's so confusing. So the two Matthew White bishops, uh, who had received the Caritasia back in seventy one, the rather full Caritasia, which is what I consider to be Caritasia. But anyway, they come into co they do not agree. They did not agree back in seventy five with the Matthew Whites breaking communion with Rocor. So they actually separated from the Matthewites in 75 and joined the Florinites so they could still stay in communion with Rocor. All right? So I, not just Callistos, I think Epiphany did the same thing. And I think it's at that point the Matthewites have this declaration saying that, you know, they reject the Caritasia and they, you know, you know, it was very a bad idea and so they, they you know, it was a horrible decision and et cetera, et cetera, you know? So uh, the Callistos, then he begins to, begins to, for lack of a better word, Plot. I don't know if I don't know if I, I that, that's the most accurate well, word. Some, are, some argue that Callistos himself was an old man, but it was basically the people around him. Okay, so all right, all right. To create a faction, so, where but a plot like, is a plot is created. Yes, whether he did it or it's the people around him, because you could say right. the same thing with Bishop Matthew Brestina. Was yeah, it just that, like Eugene Tombros and others kind of controlling him, etc.? You know, exactly. So, so the, what the, the moral of the story is: a bunch of new bishops were created without the permission. Okay, so, of the what happens in 1979? Callistos. Uh, and I think Epiphany and maybe one other uh, basically say that there's too much chaos in the Senate of Greece. And so they're going to break with Arxentius and they're going to create a whole new Senate of bishops. And so they pure, constantly. Pure Senate. Yeah. So ostensibly on 10 separate days, I hope they didn't do it all on the same day. No, it was done on 10 separate days. Okay. So 10 separate days around like a, the middle of the night, supposedly, or something, uh, they consecrate 10 new bishops. All right. And the concept is that. These are going to be like replacements for all the supposedly bishops we don't like in the current Florentine Senate. Corru the corrupt bishops. Yes, whatever, exactly. You know, that's that's the claim. Well, that's no one accepts that in the Florinites. Uh, even even the, uh, the 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 Cusis faction at the time was basically a faction. Yeah, even even they don't. Even, they're yeah, like Bishop Chris, Bishop, Metropolitan Christism Cusis didn't accept them either. Yeah. So. And so what happens is that Archbishop Exentius is like, I put under suspension all these people who are consecrated until they come back to the church and they receive some sort of regularization. And then he makes new bishops. Well, yeah. So what happens is that, however, some of these bishops actually do come officially to the to Archbishop Exentius and repent. Uh, Metropolitan Maximus of Kefalonia, who will later be his successor, um, and he, I don't know if he's given a care to see it, or they just put, I mean, they put, um, uh, they, they um, did a prayer of repentance over him or whatever. Because it's interesting, he said they were suspended from Episcopal functions, although he technically said they, which kind of means you had to recognize them to begin with, any, whatever, however you parse it. And there was a Metropolitan Kyprianos also, Katsumbas, who actually comes back to Archie Rexentius also. All right. No, I'm sorry. No, he stays with Calista. No, he never. He never yeah, comes sorry, back. Right. He forms there was, the there were two. They were right. It was it was Maximus, and there was two or maybe two or three others that go back to um, Auxentius. Okay. So I think Epiphany dies. I'm kind of vague on what happens to him, and then it's Callistos with Kyprianos at that time. All right. So um, then you have what's called the Callistos Synod. So that makes it even more complicated. And at that point. Kipri knows has some sort of contact with the Saint Glaceri of Romania, who, who is a saint. I'm going to be frank. I will call him Saint Glaceri, who is still alive, the leader of the Romanian or calendarists. And uh, he arranges for a caritasia of some sort to be given to the Romanian or calendarist bishops. And that's because the Romanian or calendarist bishops, their consecrations descend from Metropolitan Galaxion, who had been a Romanian new calendarist uh, patriarch and bishop who decided to join the three Romanian old calendarists like in 1955 or something and he does a single hand consecration now I'll, I, my opinion just interject if there's anybody who had a reason for a single hand consecration it's Romanian old calendarists in 1955 all right because if you look at basically you know they're living in caves and being tortured to death wherever they find them I mean even it wasn't that terrible in I mean, it was bad in Greece but it wasn't that terrible you know what I mean? 
All right. Yeah, the cops were only occasionally murdering. Yeah, they were beat. Yeah, they were occasionally beating you up and all this other stuff. In, in Romania, if they found you, you're dead. Yeah. Uh, or you're sent to a, a concentration camp where you're going to be worked to death. You know. Um, or they have a Romanian new calendar priest come in and he's in. You know, they they have him torture you and then they laugh at you. I mean, there was terrible things. The patriarch did in Romania. Anyway, um, so uh, what happens is that the Calista Synod kind of goes in communion, as I understand, with the Romanian calendarists by some through care so through care to see yeah, Okay, so that's the proto Synod in resistance, but it's not not quite the Synod in resistance yet. I I don't think Callistos. I could be wrong. I don't think Callistos would have did share the views of Kiprinos, or I don't no, know. If he, Kiprinos... he, he didn't uh, share them. It wasn't until after his death that Kiprinos that became public. Kiprinos was, yeah, with uh, I believe it was Bishop John of Luni in Italy. Yeah, and um, he based. That's when they formed the Synod in Resistance, um, where basically they try to argue that Metropolitan uh, Chrysostom of Florina during quite a the... long. Well, well, he was right during that period where he was waffling, even though he himself corrected himself. Yeah, exactly. So they basically said there was a, you know. Yes. So what happens uh, is, and of course, anyway, so what happens is back to Greece, we have the Callisto Senate, you have the Chiosis faction, which is not quite distinguished as being from the main Florinite Senate yet. It's kind of, um, and then you have uh, the Archbishop Xentius, and you have the Matthewites. Uh, the Matthewites, for all intents and purposes, we can ignore until we get to basically the late the, the mid nineteen nineties. All right. Okay. Um, simply because not a lot happens that's worth mentioning at this point in terms of breaks in their group or whatever. So what happens is I think now correct me here, Father. In nineteen eighty five, um, the attempt comes about to depose Archbishop Xentius of Athens. Well, before we get to that, I, I, I would like to because you know we 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 should bring this up. Because mm -hmm. it, it play it comes back um, in uh, in the nineteen in the late nineteen seventies um, the uh, bishop in Portugal uh, had already been given an assistant and then um, there were other bishops that were consecrated in the early part of the eighties nineteen eighty one nineteen eighty two which included people like Metropolitan of Lokios of Milan um, at, in nineteen eighty four. Uh, Archbishop Oxentius then uh, granted the Western European uh, bishops a Thomas of autonomy. Um, and the main reason for this is because he could clearly see the chaos that was occurring in Greece, and effectively he was trying to isolate them from that. So this is something to uh, keep in mind. So we get to 1985. Okay, remember, it was, it was, it was Archimandrite Gabriel that was consecrated a bishop in 1978. Yeah. Bishop of Lisbon, Okay. Uh, then six years later, a second bishop, Tiago of Lisbon, was established. Now, Gabriel was originally Father Yao or Father yes. John, but they took mm -hmm. the monastic name Gabriel. And uh, then Bishop Tiago, Tiago, which is James, was consecrated Bishop of Lisbon six years later. And then on the 9th and 23rd of September, Old Style, as well as the 30th, uh, the you know those bishops, with the permission of the Synod of Greece, elevated Bishop of Logius to Milan, Bishop Gregorio to Turin, and Bishop Theodore of Evora. All right. And we've had, of course, the consecration photos and you know that that's all there, you know, and uh, and like you mentioned on September twenty seventh, uh, in nineteen eighty four, Archbishop Exentius actually with his own hand wrote out a Thomas of Autonomy for the bishops in Western Europe. Yeah, so that, he, that was it was the feast so people, of the exaltation I, of the Holy Cross. Exactly. Now I I believe some people try to make fun of the fact that it's written on it. Well, first off, he actually took the time to write a Thomas in his own hand. All right. He didn't just, you know, get it typed up. I think that's actually impressive. And the Thomas says, I, Oxentius, by God's grace, Archbishop of Athens and all Greece, acting within the bounds of our territory of Western Europe, which I created on June 7th, 1978, have decided to give permission to the Metropoli of Portugal, Spain, and Western Europe to govern itself, having as their principal headquarters the God-protected Metropolitan City of Lisbon. This metropolis will be under the direction of the GOC of Greece. Postscript, the above Metropolitan with his vicars is obliged to present himself uh, to the hierarchical Senate each October 30th. Now, I think there might be, is that is that the entire uh, text? It looks like there's That's a lot more That's the entire writing. text. Okay. Um, and he's got the stamp and everything on it. Okay. All right, so, so then, that's, that's the creation of what we would consider to be the predecessor of our, of our Senate. Yeah, and so then now we can fast forward nine months, okay. and we get to the beginnings of what would become the 1985 trial of Archbishop Oxentios, which actually led to uh, the current situation in the Florinites now. And I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about this for Well, well the first thing we have to clarify is that the Callisto Synod at this point 
um, gets reunited in 1984 as well with um, with the Synod of Archbishop Oxentios. And this is where you start seeing some confusion because... Um, Wait, so, Kip so Kiprinos went back to Oxentius in 1984? Kiprinos never went. No. Oh, Kiprinos never went, but Callistos I himself did? Yes, and that well, I don't know if Cal I think Callistos was dead by that time. But the point is, there were like eight remaining bishops, so they all joined um, in a, what was a really hastily done union. Uh, Archbishop Macarius wrote a book on that, on how the union was done in really kind of a hasty and non canonical manner. It had had its side effects later. Yeah, and those side effects would show up later on. But okay, the so point what? Is, now, first, just to dispel something about the the, the pseudo trial. Where there was no, there was they claimed they deposed him. They, cl I've heard people claim that sixteen bishops deposed Archbishop Exentius. Well, there were only sixteen bishops in the church, the Florinite church at the time, including Archbishop Exentius. All right, it wasn't sixteen bishops that deposed him. All right. Secondly, I think about four of those bishops, or maybe five, were actually accusers in the trial. Yeah, the the ones who came from the Callisto Synod, yes. in fact, were also accusers. Yeah, you so cannot you set on a judges exactly. were actually okay. accusers, That's yeah. which is you canonically can, impossible. Yeah. According to canon law, which is from ancient Roman law, biblical law, you cannot be an accuser and a judge in a trial. So if you're saying Archer Exentius ordained you know who, who was the guy they claim he ordained that he said he didn't even he didn't, he didn't. yeah the uh, the what was his name Alexander supposedly he was made a, a, a priest in Alexandria but he was he claims Archer Exentius was like I don't remember ordaining this guy I can't remember his, it's not it's not Demetrius no not, no that's 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 the later guy it's uh, hold on Dorotheo Sakos Dorotheo Sakos okay so f four or five of them are saying you know he he did this and this is why he has to be deposed and by the way we're gonna you know we're judges also in this case and so Archer Exentius you know. As I recall, what happens is they call him, they ask him to come meet them. Yeah, he, he refers he, to it. He basically treats it as a farce, and he says, "I'm not going." He goes. Well, doesn't he, did he did he know about it beforehand? No, okay. I, I think they just came and said, "We're going to do this." And yeah, he was yeah, like, so, and he had already put together an investigative committee about Dorothy Osakos because exactly. he did not want to ordain him. Exactly. So, so he was so, already investigating the situation to begin with. So they created a new investigation, but this time they decided to put Archbishop Oxentios himself on trial. Um, Again, which, which you can do, which you yeah. could not, which you could not do because you know, first off, you need what at least twelve bishops to hold a canonical trial, and you'd need twelve bishops who none of our none of whom exactly. are cannot accused. be accusers. Technically, you need thirteen bishops because you would need to have a, a tie-breaking vote, actually. Right, but, because of the fact that you're especially you're trying the, the metropolitan of the see the Archbishop. Exactly. But All in right. any case, so the, the, so. That, one so, of many canonical. Okay, so the leader of that faction that wants Archbishop Exentius deposed is uh, Chrysostomus Cusis, and he's well, No, he's not. He's not involved yet. He's kind of like there should Wait, be a trial, but he's still standing off on the side. Wait a minute. So he is not. Okay. So how many? Then how many people were there involved actually in the invest in the in the pseudo investigative committee? Then I, I think it was. Uh, I think it was uh, the number was closer to twelve, if I remember correctly. But um, it was basically the accusers and the judges were the same people. See, that was the problem, of course. So if four or five of those people are accusers, they cannot be judges. It's just, yeah. so I'm sorry, you cannot do that. Well, so, it's kind of funny because Vladimir Moss actually lists the people that voted against him as accusers. And so I, it was a Freudian slip, obviously. But the point is that if everyone in the trial who's acting is an accuser, it's a show trial. It, it's not a real trial at all. Yeah, it's like the so, judge, the ju being judge, jury, and prosecution. You can't do it. And so the point is, um, you know, a lot of the bishops do not, you know. Some and Father Basil the, Sakas actually wrote a very good paper on this whole sh well, show. Well, yeah, the whole thing he shows that even the the documentation for Dorotheo Sakos was totally forged. But the point is that when it what it comes right down to is that afterwards, uh, Archbishop Exentios and his fellow bishops, um, along with the Western European bishops. Uh, you know, obviously they protest, they, you know, they don't accept this trial, so that's uh, basically where that goes. Mm -hmm. At this point, the faction, having claimed to depose Archbishop Accentius, then invites Chrysostom Cusis, who seems to have been knowledgeable of the entire situation, so he was definitely getting back and forth on that, but um, he kind of stayed out of it and kind of, like, just held basically everyone in contempt. And so it wasn't until afterwards that he then says, okay, well, you know, they invite him basically to... He, what, what does he consider a fait accompli? He might as well become Archbishop already? 
Well, yeah, well, it's kind of like at that point they invite him because they want to, you know, he says basically none of you are clean, so you have to have a clean person come in. So he comes in, um, and he votes alongside um, the other Archbishop of Thessalonica because they make a deal basically to uh, to uh, kind of just make him Archbishop. And so the, that becomes that, and that is um, where we start dealing with the origin of what it, we we tend to call now, and it's really kind of a kind of an accident. But we tend to call that the GOCK because of the fact that back then it was a dispar it was um, a disparagement because they used to refer to Chrysostom's last name, Cusis. But now Archbishop Kalinikos actually has a first name with a K, so why change it? So in any case, but that's where you start. Talking now this about time it. is also when we get the legal battles over the building and the general fund mm -hmm. happening too. That's, that's correct, right. because you know, and I and I believe they actually take Archbishop Exentius to actual Greek civil court, and that's when they begin to ask him, you know, to prove this or what you or did you ordain Dorotheus Sacius, and you know, Archbishop Exentius makes a statement something like what, you know, if I ordained him, I don't remember it, and I don't, I, you know, I I never saw the man, etc., you know. Um. Anyways, well, now this is also now it's interesting because this is where we have to start dealing with uh, the problem of Hakna, because at this point now that Hakna has basically become a parachurch within Rokor, but is also you know vehemently opposed to ecumenism. Um, there had begun investigations in 1985 as to whether uh, the elder was um, uh, acting immorally uh, under a number of accusations from monks and former monks. Mm -hmm. And so, and it's okay. only it's only once Metropolitan Saint Philaret dies and the election of Metropolitan Vitali transpires that Vitali basically, you know, kind of turns on his former supporters in Hockney. Yeah, he has no use for them because they're not. Well, Hockney. he had a use for them to get elected. He had a, he had that use, yeah. um, but not not after this point. And and also he becomes antagonistic to Bishop Gregory Grabe. Um, yeah, like, that has to do with the fact that people viewed. Uh, uh, Father George Grabby, later Bishop Greg Grabby, is like supposedly the power behind the throne figure, and so people have. There were a lot of people who wanted to get try to get rid of him. Um, anyway, I mean, there were even people claiming that he wrote the sorrowful epistles. I mean, it, it, there's still people saying that, which is ridiculous. Yeah. Okay, so uh, and of course we know what happens. Uh, uh, you know, the investigation proceeds in HTM. Father Pentelaman has to go before at one point Archer Anthony of Los Angeles, I think, and, Arch and Father Pentelaman says something like, well, if, if I did these things, then I'd have to be an atheist and just lying to you right now, or something like that, you know? Um, so, um, I believe, what, Tim, if, correct me if I'm wrong, Father Joseph, uh, trying to keep all this together, um, what happens is HTM then puts together kind of like a dossier of why they have to leave Rogue now. Or right, and it's spread among clergy that are loyal to Father Pentelaman. Yeah, and so they basically say, well, Vitali has changed the course of Rokor by, by teaching ecumenism. And that's because Mitchell Vitali, when he was actually back in, was it back in 86, when he was only still Archbishop of uh, Toronto or something like that? Or was it, was mm -hmm. it not? No, Montreal, I believe. Yeah. He had written a nativity encyclical. And in the nativity encyclical, Archbishop Vitali, later Metropolitan Vitali, says that. Uh, Though the new against ecumenism is a local what happened. Yeah, and, and he, in his view is that the new calendar and the world patriarchate still have the grace have the grace of the sacraments. So there's still churches, even though we're separated from them and we can't do stuff with them on a regular basis or something exactly. like that. Exactly. And this is enough to rile up the supporters of Father Ponalaman and to uh, cause them to break from Rokor in 1986. It's, it's, so, it is. It is in nineteen. It is in. The, it is in nineteen eighty six. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, are we sure it's not? Are we sure it's not nineteen eighty seven? Because that nativity encyclical was not a. Was not oh a no, that was eighty six. That's yeah. But they had already been plotting this, and so it was just. And remember, there was another case when they claim a Rokor priest had been celebrated with a, 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 an Episcopal minister, and and what yeah, it it turned out to be a wedding. Yeah, well, it, was like it wasn't a celebration. What had happened is that the the Rokor priest was was doing the wedding, and the the bride's father was an Episcopalian minister. And at one point at the end of the wedding, uh, he asked if he could say a few words. And uh, he said a few words, and then he he, 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 he did he his Episcopalian blessing over his daughter. And they're like, oh, we have this on videotape. And, and, the, and the priest's explanation was, I didn't know what to do. The wedding was over. I wasn't going to get in a big fight with him, you know, or something like that, you know? Yeah. So, um, you know, and, there were a lot of... And, of course, they did bring up Anthony of Geneva a lot, which actually yeah, was... Anthony which, of Geneva that's a legitimate problem Rokor football. never addressed, and they were never going to address... Uh, he was he was there he was there a humanist in the uh, sheepfold. Yeah. Um, 
So uh, at that point, Hockna, the proto Hockna, uh, initially I believe they want to try to get the Matthew Whites to make to, to be, take them in, correct? Yeah, the Matthew Whites don't even touch it. Yeah, I think the Matthew Whites already knew ahead of time either that someone had told them about Father Pentelayman or his reputation preceded them. Again, they didn't want to be involved in any of that. Right. So then they uh, went to a then they went to Akakius and Gabriel, who were yes. two bishops who had separated. Um, they were, I believe they were up in Canada, Canada, though, right? Yeah, they were in Canada. Who who had um, made them? Uh, if I remember, I'm not sure if they were. I believe they were bishops of the Callisto system, if I remember okay. correctly. So they go to them, but they don't get ordination from them, I assume. Well, yeah, they, well, it, it had become clear to you know to Akakius and Gabriel, who didn't they kind of fell out with each other, that they clearly did not want to. Uh, they didn't want to make new bishops for them immediately, which was kind of like kind of a goal, yeah. uh, you know, for HTM and crew. Maybe they and detected so, what was happening. You know, they, they probably had a feeling. But in any case, so they, what ends up happening is they go to Archbishop Accentius. This is the same person that uh, Father Punalaman had referred to as, I believe, the trash heap of orthodoxy. The garbage pit of orthodoxy. Yeah. That's what and then he now he went running for, you know, for that because he, I think he sensed, and I think that that's a pretty astute observation, that if, considering Archbishop Accentius had just gone through a show trial which caused, you know, chaos and disorder uh, in his own synod, now there were two rival synods. Uh, in Greece, they figured, well, this is a perfect opportunity to just mosey on over and uh, you know see what we can get. And uh, and also, I think they just they, they they detected weakness in the sense of they had been like you said they had been weakened from this fight. They didn't have you know maybe they could take advantage of the situation by saying, oh look, there's all these people that want to join you. What this big giant monastery in Boston we have exactly you know. And I believe Gregory of Colorado. And and and, 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 and again, what they said, and, and again, what HTM says is that. You know, uh, because we're so anti-ecumenist, Rokor made up all this stuff and has gotten all these people to lie about us, and they want to destroy anti-ecumenism, and therefore they're claiming that Father Pentelayman, you know, sexually abused all these people. Yeah. All right? And that's and always, that's fair, always now, Archbishop Oxentios had just been accused with the whole Dorothy Osakos thing because Dorothy Osakos was himself a homosexual. So, of course, he's going to be sympathetic and, and think Father Panalaman's a victim. Yeah, and of course, in retrospect, no one no one in their right mind brings up the Dorothy Osakos affair against Oxentios if they know the history. Uh, they, I mean, maybe there are some people, but everybody kind of acknowledges he didn't get made a bishop by Oxentios. Yeah. Okay, so what happens is that he agrees to take them in, and I think, what is it, around 1989... That or 1988 is it? 1988 is okay, when he, he makes. Uh, yeah, he makes. I think uh, Macarius of Toronto is consecrated a bishop, right? So it's yeah, Macarius and Ephraim, I believe, were uh, consecrated yes, the, exactly. And uh, and then they proceed. I don't. At what point? I don't know when the other ones were made by uh, by them. Well, Bishop Moses, if I remember correctly, was made with the help of Archbishop Maximus, not with the help. Of that that would be like in 1990. Uh, Xintia has died what 94, so that'd be like 95 and 96, something like that. So. So anyway, uh, so that's just how that proceeds with the Hockness situation. Um, there happened to be there happened to be a monk there who was very big on iconography, um, who uh, was um, you know part of the HTM group, but he had heard these things and he ends up becoming Hockness' loudest accuser for the next you know probably the next twenty years. And yes. but in the process. Um, he also goes from synod to synod. Uh, his name was Father Gregory of Colorado, who now we know as Archbishop Gregory of Colorado of the GOC of America. And that basically was an embarrassing kind of, he was kind of an embarrassing guy because, you know, on the one hand, he was very consistent in his attacks on Father Ponalaman. But on the other hand, it was very clear that he really, really wanted to be a bishop. And um, I think that the problem was that HTM sort of cult-like mentality uh, kind of rubbed off on him. And so the, the, the same cult-like mentality still exists. Now, granted, it's without the, without the gay, but it's still, you know, it's still a cult-like mentality. Um, so this is where, you know, he forms a rival monastery, which he, you know, did, never collects too many people. I think it, at most it might have had four monks at one point. But the point is that um, basically... Uh, we're, that, get, we're getting ahead of us because he's technically made a bishop by Roak later. Well, he's not made. Well, yeah, but he, my point is that the the Colorado faction thing that began um, that began around this time, and it was around 1990 that you begin to see him become active as Father Gregory, not Bishop Gregory. So just to, just to close up, uh, so what happens is um, Archbishop Xentius um, reposes in 1994. 
Uh, all these people come to his funeral saying that, you know, we did so-and-so bad, terrible things to you. They were, like, repenting at his funeral, but they never did anything after that. Yeah. Um, and then Archer Maximus is elected. And initially, the true vine issues, like, praise Archer Maximus to the sky, saying, we've known this man. He's Right. Now, yeah, Hawkeye is terrible. loving Archbishop Maximus. But then Maximus begins to, begins to uh, open the investigation about what? About Pontus Pentelaman. And then gradually, the same things that they, uh, uh, the uh, HDM did to Rokor, and they did to Greek Archdiocese before them, to be honest, uh, they began to do to Archbishop Maximus. They began to destroy his, rep attack his reputation. They began to well, attack uh, what, Bishop Athanasius of Limassol. Yeah, or well, uh, Larissa. But, the, the, but now this is an interesting point, because one thing to remember is that Archbishop Oxentius remained in communion with the Western European Synod, which yeah, was now example, centered in Milan. Yeah, exact point mentioned one of Logius, Archbishop Gregorio, Gregorio of Turin, uh, and the other bishops. Chile of Ostia. Yeah, that's like we, we were going over and celebrating with Oxentius during all this time. All right, so, so we were still now, Hockna, and, we, and then we were communing with Maximus, obviously. So, well, yeah, and so Hockna didn't have much of an answer to this, so they just pretended we didn't exist. Yeah. Um, and then you know, and I actually heard that from you know their clergy in HTM. So the point is, you know, there was a, a controversy with a some mystic who converted from Roman Catholicism to the group in Portugal, which eventually joined the Polish Church. But um, effectively, they use that as some sort of battering ram to imply that we were some sort of crypto Roman Catholic. But it was only the, but, today. But a point, po the problem point is that it was only a Portuguese segment of the church that that the right, exactly. was then everybody were, else. Right. Yeah. And by and by then, Milan, you know, Milan was in charge there. So that's it's an important thing to note that while they were claim Hockna was claiming to be the successors of Archbishop Oxentios, in actual fact, there were actually there was actually an autonomous body that was formed by Archbishop Oxentios and recognized by him until the end of his life and yes. by Archbishop Maximus afterwards. Now curiously, so let's let's go through our through that so that since that's that's our history back in the late seventies. Yeah now that we're talking yeah we're talking now about we can get now we can go we can go over that and of course people are wondering when are we going to get to the point of a of a saying this and that about everybody else, but we're kind of saying this and that, this and that. Yeah, about we're, we're going by in pieces. We haven't even yeah. touched the Matthewites after 1980 yet. Yeah, I mean we've got we've not gotten to the Gregorians and the God the Father icon stuff. That's not yeah. that's so not we're, even. You're not going there up. yet. We're getting yeah. there. Don't worry. We might have to backtrack a little. It does does cause problem with the visual timeline. I will yeah. say that. So now, uh, so what happened? Yeah. So what happens is uh, something very curious happens in 19. I think it's 1988 with Metropolitan of Logius. Okay. So, of Logius in our synod at that point, uh, this is obviously the former Metropolitan of Logius. He later becomes the former one, even when he's still alive later, but that's another long story. Um, at this point, he is contacted back in what, 1988? Is that correct, Father Joseph? By Kiprian, by Metropolitan Kiprian of Philly. Yeah. No, nope, you're uh, right. Yeah, this is a and this is a very strange situation, uh, in which he agrees to help uh, Cyprian consecrate a bishop, and this is the well-known Chrysostomus Gonzalez of um, of Edna. All right, I believe Gonzalez is his last name. I believe. Well, it's a, it's actually a hyphenated Spanish Greek last name. I'm okay. not a fan of using the Gonzalez because the reason that it um it actually well, what, what, I don't know what his last name is, and usually you have yeah. to say last names. No, I, maybe I, I shouldn't. I, maybe I, I shouldn't do I that. Actually, I'll, let me get it for you because okay. Well, I shouldn't. Have, I, I I'm I, I, I wanted well, to no, distinguish there's, there's from other for this. That's that's why yeah. I bring this up. So, the, but the point is, is that he helps uh, Kiprinos uh, consecrate Chrysostomus of Etna. OK, yeah. uh, I'm not sure if he is the chief consecrator or the co-consecrator, because some of the photos look you don't really see the actual consecration with laying one of hands. You see like him taking on the altar. You see if Logie is handing him the mitre. It's, yeah, his, some... his full name was uh, uh, his full last name was uh, uh, hold on. Gonzalez de Turiaga Alexopoulos. Oh, well, uh, Alexopoulos. OK. Yeah. But the point is, the reason why few people know that is because in the struggle against ecumenism, the the authors purposely and that's the Hockna book. They purposely refer to him as Chrysostom Gonzalez. Now, this there's a reason for that. And that is, frankly, because they wanted to give the impression that Chrysostomus was a full blood Mexican and wasn't actually Greek. <laughs> and that means you're not going to be you can't be Orthodox if you're Mexican, I guess. Well, the whole idea is it was that's the implication, look right? Legitimate as a Greek bishop. Yeah. 
Okay, so anyway, during this period, for some strange reason, of Logius, while he's in communion with Oxentius, agrees to help consecrate uh, Chrysostomus. Um, and he's consecrated, and I think he also helps consecrate the next day some Nigerian bishop that was under Kiprinos or something was, I, I, you know. But anyway, um, and I don't think the communion or whatever relationship that's happened between Kiprinos and Evlogius does last that long. There's various disputes. I don't think there. Were, I don't think there was a formal communion agreement because it was almost immediately afterwards that Kiprian begins to attack Metropolitan Evlogius. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I think also that was also during the time uh, when I think even the Synod, even both the Cusis faction and Auxentius Synod make declarations of like deposition of Kiprinos or something like that. There was various, you know, uh, declarations. And then eventually one of Logius and our Senate actually make a statement back in like in 1993 or something or 94 that we do not consider the ecclesiological uh, theories of Mitchell and Kiprian to be in accordance with church history and canons and things like that. Um, so we actually have an anti-Kiprian statement that's like 25 years ago, whatever. Um, I mean, it's kind of moderate in how it how it analyzes things, but it, we have that there. We didn't fully anathematize them. But. Well, the problem was is that I don't think we wanted to say Rocourt's now commune with heretics or something. Yeah, like that. The, I we, mean, we and, tried and, to stay in good relations with mean, everyone. And even though they didn't, even though we didn't have any formal, you know, you didn't. People tended not want to attack Rocourt at least at that point, unless you were Hakna. Um, anyway, so that happens. That doesn't really work out. Uh, I mean, there's some good things that come out of the Kiprino. Some people join the Lamian Synod from it. I mean, I'm much more Angelos came, comes out of that and such. So it's not, you know, absolutely terrible. Um, but I think Metron of Logius and a few other people said that, that was like one of his great regrets that he he, he helped Kiprino because he felt, you know, the guy betrayed him or whatever. I don't know. Now, there's always a second, another side to the story, of course, you know. Yeah. And but, unfortunately, um, both parties have died in this case. Yes. So. And, you know, I know they, they called Marchman of Logius the Soi de Saint Archbishop of Milan. But they weren't calling him a soi de sant when he was helping doing the Yeah, they didn't call him a soi de sant consecrator of Metropolitan Chrysostomus of that. Exactly. It's only bec and they and they don't really talk a lot in their publication about who was the one that helped. In fact, in the struggle against ecumenism, I'm not sure if not in the mountain struggle, but the hot the, the old um the Edna books, I'm not even sure if they actually mention Metropolitan of Logius. No. They I don't. mean they just there's maybe one periodical somewhere that says something like, and if Logius was dismissed from the Synod. Well, it was pretty funny because um, it was pretty funny because it was in one of their old websites, the old Milan websites, where they to answer Chrysostomus of Etna, they just put up pictures of his consecration. Yeah, and they didn't like that because they no, wanted they, they, they were not because generally in true orthodoxy, uh, I mean, for good or ill, one of the things that you just you kind of unperson people, I guess. Um, but any, but anyway, um, well, and this is part of the reason why uh, we're doing this show is because the simple reality is everybody has problems and the and the idea that there is a perfect synod you're going to join isn't true because we're not perfect people um so one of the things we want to clarify here is that we know that there are problems in every synod including ours and so we're now stating them yes okay so around that time also more controversially Mitch Vogius establishes what as far as i can is some sort of personal communion with the uh, Ukrainian Orthodox Church in exile under Metro of Mistress Law. It's yeah. 1989. And of course, the Mistress Law of people, they're not dead hands people. Everybody call, every now and then brings that up. They actually were made by the Polish Orthodox back in like 1942 or 43. So he establishes some sort of communion with uh, Metro of Mistress Law while he's still in communion with Archie Vexentius. All right. Uh, and then there begins the relationship or the attempt to form some sort of relationship with. Uh, the nascent Kievan Patriarchate prior to basically having the infamous Fuller Denisenko basically being their quote unquote patriarch. Yeah. Right. Uh, now, in the old calendars we used to get from Greece from like 94, 95, 96, I have a few here, you actually see they actually, um, Archbishop Maximus has like got his photo on it and then like they're listing people he's in communion with and they actually list uh, Patriarch Volodymyr Romaniak of Kiev. Uh, and this is uh, ostensibly this is the time in which uh, now Hakna pretends this never exists because they're also in communion with Archbishop of Argentius, All right, I mean, I mean, uh, Maximus. The Archbishop Maximus, yeah. exactly for that year, yeah, yeah. So um, to me, it's a it, I've I've tried to get information because a lot of the information on this actually comes from archives in Milan, which we're probably not going to have any opportunity in the near future to get a hold of. For example, I only learned like two years ago when someone sent it to me. I, I've tried to contact the person to, to get them a copy of it 
uh, the autocephaly agreement, uh, where Archer Maximus actually said, you know, wanted to make Evlogius autocephalous. Um, anyway, that's I, we don't really I don't we don't have that in our online church history simply because I don't have the document for it. Yeah. I know it now, from word it, of mouth. It, it's from worth noting that around ninety five, and we will get to Matthewites, and we will get to Russia. But this uh, is us we're covering, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the point is, it is worth noting that uh, it's during this period, around ninety five. Um, Archbishop Maximus makes new bishops uh, after receiving in a new calendar as priest uh, named, I think, Demetrius Biff, and they make him Archbishop. Of, so they make him Archbishop of Cyprus. So he was a priest, correct? Yeah. So he, he receives him, which is the, and I can t guarantee you, he receives him by Kiratasia. That's the formal way of receiving new calendar as priests. Uh, but then he consecrates him a bishop, correct? So who? So Archbishop Maximus. Do we know? Was it Auxentius of Aegina? Was I, I, also yeah. I, Auxentius II is one of the. Eight well, bishops. he's not the same as Auxentius of Aegina, is he? No, Auxentius II is actually a nephew of Archbishop Auxentius. Okay, Auxentius. Oh, Auxentius of Aegina of, of, of Aegina, You said yeah, that's him. I think he was he was the concept he was he was the consecrator for the other consecrator for Demetrius, correct? No, I think he was made by uh, Maximus, etc. Okay. All right. So, uh, but the controversy is around uh, Demetrius Bifa when Maximus consecrated with his bishops consecrated the bishop. And what's the controversy about Demetrius Bifa? Uh, well, the, the the thing is, it was presented that basically that he was illegally made because he, you know, Maximus was considered an opposed monk. But when you get right down to it, then, oh, you know, well, wait, wait, so wait, that's that's the that's the Cusis faction line about it. Though. Yeah, exactly. So okay, well, they, they, they're not the same line everyone was using okay, against so each other. And then it's not really an issue in the sense that they're both not in communion with each other and they consider each other deposed. Right. So you, why, you would expect them to say that. Yes. All right. So just like we would expect our bishops in that time in Greece to say that any consecrations by Chrysostomos, Cusis, and his bishops would be considered no consecrations at all also. Uh, it's worth noting that it was in this time period where Metropolitan Angelos of Avlona was actually made by, uh, I believe it was Metropolitan Cyprian and Metropolitan Agaf well, uh, Bishop Agafangal of Odessa. Okay, so what happened is that Bishop Agafangal was sent as the representative, because at that time, Angelos was an archimandry in the Sinan resistance. This is 1996, actually. Yeah. And um, he is elected by this the Cyprianites uh, to be a bishop of Avlona. So what happens is that the chief consecrator is Cyprianos in the Metropolitan Velasius is sent as a representative of the Romanians. And um, Agafango, since he's like, I guess, in Odessa, it's the closest Rokor bishop, so they just send him, you know? So they do the consecration for Anglos of Avlona, and he's, of course, the um, Greek first hierarch we're in communion with at the current current point. Um, but I, but I, not to get too off topic, I, and I wanted to get back to us real quick. And so, look, we're already an hour, hour and 22 minutes, and we're, we yeah. hardly touch, touch anything. Um, so at that point, um, the Synod of Archbishop Maximus and ourselves, we have tried to have some sort of relationship with the Kievan Patriarchate. Uh, it, we kind of were able to work out some sort of agreement with Patriarch Volodymyr. Yeah, there, because, I, yeah, I, I actually put the translation in my book. Yes, I mean Volodymyr himself was not an evil man, and you know I can't. And Maximus uh, seemed to believe because there is well, actually a sermon. Confessor, I mean, yeah, there is actually a sermon by Volodymyr in which he says that. Um, he does not regard the Sergius as a church, and that you know the true Orthodox. That's the right that he actually talks about true. He Orthodox. did actually believe in true Orthodox. Yes. Uh, now the problem they're going to bring up is why was he associated with Philaret? Uh, uh, my view is simply Philaret just told people whatever he they wanted to hear. I, I also, uh, well, and, if I, I mean, remember correctly, Patrick Vladimir was in very ill health in the last years, and Philaret took it. Well, he was. Well, remember he was only technically paid for like twenty months or something like yeah. that, and then and like yeah. in. I mean, but there was the period before that, and anyway. So what transpired? I've, I've heard suspicious. I've heard, you know, and again, this is anecdotal. Well, he had three heart attacks already. By Philaret himself. Well, he had three heart attacks already, um, and he was already in bad health. And um, basically, um, you know, he was being held. I mean, there's actually, believe it or not, an OrthoChristian.org article which actually covers pretty well. Uh, but yeah, from an MP they, perspective, they still like kind of attack him, but they do say he's like a prisoner of conscience. Yeah, they have, they have to admit he wasn't a fraud or something like that because he yeah. was like tortured. And, you know, he had his son put in a, in a Soviet in a psychiatric facility where they give him electric shock for like hours a day and such. So they couldn't like they, they could they always have to be careful. It's easier to attack Philaret than a single. Well, no, actually, well, I think that article was to attack Philaret because basically that article yeah. was saying, well, at least this guy was, you know, honest. At least he wasn't evil, I guess. That's what yeah. that's their view. So, yeah. um, 
basically, if you read that article, you have you have and you can read between the MP lines. You can basically check what happened. Uh, you know, Volodymyr dies under mysterious circumstances. Uh, his the daughter, or supposedly niece, of, really the daughter of Floret, finds him. Volodymyr had been held basically, and he was not even allowed to leave the uh, patriarchal residence for months. <coughs> and assassinated. People were breaking in there, harassing him. It was something that's pretty terrible. And Floret didn't like us. And I mean, at this point, he wanted to get rid of us, so he had no he use for. To, he, that within like months, we were, you know, at the, the more. We had no use for a Western European synod that was independent or Greek synod like Mac. We didn't have any use for us, and so at that point, basically, he's like, uh, "You're going to uh, abolish yourselves." And you're going to draw, and you, and then he gets up, and you know, and then it's like there's no, there's not really interaction between uh, Milan and Fullerett. It's kind of like this null zone point. So finally, they started. And then, well, well, what happens is that the, the final official break transpires in '97 when uh, our future American um, missions get taken in, and uh, and that point, it's like already over, you know. In a now, it is worth noting because this is, you know, one of the sorriest things of the uh, of this period, um, and that is that it was during this period that uh, Lev, uh, Deacon Lev Pahalo, who had been censured by the Rokor, mm -hmm. um, had actually come to uh, the Synod of Archbishop Accentius and eventually uh, joined uh, our own West European Synod and became Bishop of Canada. Uh, yeah. Again, one, once again, it's uh, the same story. If there's one thing that unfortunately is true uh, for the history of true orthodoxy from the 70s to probably the 2010s, it's that a lot of opportunists found a lot of opportunity. And the point is, so Lazar Pahalo joins us. And then when the whole thing with Philaret Denisenko happens, he immediately switches over his loyalty to Philaret Denisenko. Now, remember, originally he left Rokor as a deposed deacon, and then he Correct. joined the Free Serbs, and they made him, a bit, made him a priest. And then they, the Free Serbs didn't want to make him a bishop. And so then he basically, you know, gets a Vlogius and, um, I guess, Oxentius to approve. I would technically wouldn't have to approve him, theoretically, yeah. and so uh, to make him a bishop. And then... If, then you know, of course, I wish we had the old uh, old Milan Center website because there's all this stuff about. You yeah, know, it, it's on archive. It's worth yeah. looking for. But the point is, yeah, that and then of that course, Lazarus La Lazar basically betrays the Senate in '97. Yeah, and that's and, what actually when many of the Senate websites actually went down. And uh, yeah, remember, remember the Philaret people took like hacked some of the sites. Like, yeah. They took over a bunch of Italian websites. It was terrifying. But in any case, all right. So, so that happens. That this that that's our history. Uh, essentially, at that point. Um, and well, our hold, okay, hold on. Good. Uh, Jordan Brown asks, where did your American bishops come from again? I will dev, we will definitely answer that. However, this time period is very interesting because up until 1995, the Matthewites could say, well, at least there wasn't a schism between us. Oh, well, uh, what happens in 95 is the whole controversy over the Godfather icons in the Matthewites. That's correct. And so we begin uh, the, Gregor the Gregorian school. schism, as it's called. And it, you know, it was a schism of five versus four. So, in fact, it was originally, you could say, a schism of the majority. But so, I, I, my understanding is the Gregorians who were led by the, what, the, the Matthewite Metropolitan of Thessalonica or yeah. Messina mm -hmm. or something like that. Gregory of Messina. Yeah. He claims, Messina, yeah. so his view is that the God the Father icons, having depicting of God the Father, is canonical and acceptable. And he also says that the uh, icon th that shows Christ kind of getting standing up out of the tomb with the flag, I don't know if you've seen that before. He says that's acceptable too. That's also kind of a minor side issue that's there as well. But the other bishops uh, were like, well, we don't have, they don't condemn it, but they're like saying, well, we don't have to have these. We can say we don't want these icons. Um, and that point, Gregor Messina says that these are the neo iconoclasts. They're right. promoting neo iconoclasm. And so he breaks communion with them over accusations of being them being new iconoclast heretics. Now, to be what well, to be uh, to be fair, the main branch of the Matthewites at this point, still led by Archbishop Andreas, does come out with a statement saying we don't condemn the God the Father icons or anything of the yes. sort. But that's and not then, enough for Gregor Messina because they their view is you have to accept it, not that just you can use them if you want. Right, and it became that at that point it became a point of contention between the Matthewites, and it became the first major schism in the Matthewite jurisdiction. Now so, there was an attempt. There was an attempt to cause problems like this in the seventies and eighties in the Florines, but it didn't fly. There was Doctor Alexander Calamiros, uh, who in fact was very much dislike God of any any God the Father depictions whatsoever, mm -hmm. and he and found he, a friend in HTM. Yeah, exactly. He found, and he was also inimical to uh, Father Seraphim Rose. So uh, what happens with, now? He did write an interesting book called the uh, what? Um, uh, not the struggle against ecumenism. Uh, 
for, against False Union. That against actually, False Union. That was that was his claim to fame against yes. False Union. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it, it's all it's that. it's an all right book. It's an all right introduction. It's not. It right. has it has its dark problems to it, but I'm not yes. going to get into those. Exactly. Now. But yeah. what is interesting, however, so what happens is, what happens to him? Just to be frank, is he ends up not accepting the fact that Archbishop Exentius will will allow God the Father icons, or he goes to an Archbishop Exentius church, and it's like they have a God, they have a an icon of the Holy Trinity, and he like walks out and he. Then he decides, basically, to him and his family have their own chapel, and, and they kind of become like priestless new believers, for lack of a better word. Yeah, well, what ends up, and it, well, the story, his story is interesting because what ends up happening is that he um, eventually turns on the Oxentio Synod, and he goes to the only remaining bishop who he thinks can possibly be a true bishop, who is ironically at the time Lazar Puhala. Uh, <laughs> and so, yeah, he was literally Puhala was taking care of his parish until his death. And so that that community of Saint John the Theologian. What about Photius Cantaglu? How was he associated with all of them? Was he Photius like Cantaglu wasn't really associated with it much at all. He actually, you know, while he was into the whole like revival thing and he used a lot of the modernist language, he was never that like he was never nuts like. Calibre. I guess he was just an iconographer, right? I mean, yeah, he, yeah, he he might have just he he didn't have a positive opinion of God the Father icons, and a lot of iconographers don't. But the point is, he was not like you know he wasn't like great communion him, over it. Burn him down like like the late Father John Lewis, who ended his life um, after leaving every major TOC synod, ended his life under the Ecumenical Patriarchate. Well, he didn't end his life; his life ended. Um, you know, was famous for when he was in a Rocor par he was taking care of a Rocor parish in this in the 1980s, and literally um, when they didn't want to remove the God the Father icon that had been there for a hundred years from the church ceiling. He simply went up with a scaffolding and just defaced it, so they had to paint over it. I mean, you see so, people do the similar things with the Tikvan icon. They try yeah, to this pretend is, this is insanity when, when you start seeing stuff like that. But that's the sort of thing that we were that you would see deal that was being dealt with, and unfortunately, it had finally reached the Matthewites. Okay, and so first okay, major. System. And so that's that's the break between the Gregorian Matthewites and what would be called the Andrean Matthewites or the Nicolaian Matthewites or whatever. Yeah, now, yeah the Stefan and Math Stefania. Yeah, now it's just Stefanus. So that transpires, and then a few years later, and I'm, I'm on my mind, I'm, I'm trying to keep this all together. There was a, 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 a there was a lay Matthew White theologian called Kira, who would later be called Kirikos. Yeah. Okay? Uh, the, what was his name? Gutsenatz it. Gutsenid It's like Gutsenid Gutsenidzi or something like that. It's like G O U T Z I N I or something. Something like that. That's his last name. But anyway, um. I, I think he is consecrated one in the early 2000s. Yeah. And, by and some Andreas. argue that as the lay theologian, he was pushing for a lot of these strange theories, such as the Rocor. The eternal theme. church thinking, right? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so he, he's consecrated. And then immediately he begins to agitate. And his view is that, uh, by his view, uh, Mitch von Kirikos's view is that by. Um, Accepting that we have to have like some kind of formal condemnation of the Kiritasia, because if we don't, we acknowledge that we allowed our apostolic succession to be tampered with, or something like that. Yeah, and uh, I, I cannot get. I, I mean, to be honest, uh, there are other people who might be more knowledgeable, but he has a break with Archbishop Andreas. Well, that yeah, he he, he does for well. What happens is. Um, he does break with him temporarily, if I remember correctly, but then it, the, the Synod of Kyrikos isn't formed until 2005, because what happens is Archbishop Andreas is so sick and old. He's, at this point, he's one of the longest running bishops in the world. I think the only per the only bishop who, I think, I think he was like lasted two months longer than Metropolitan Vitali as a bishop. I mean, uh, he was but, Archbishop since the late 60s or something. Yeah, like he was that, like the 51 or 52 years as a bishop, but he gets really sick, and so the Synod votes to put Archbishop Nicholas in. So that's when Bishop Kyrikos and a couple of other bishops uh, choose not to recognize the enthronement of Archbishop Nicholas because of some claim that at one point, um, you know, he uh, he stated in a court trial to protect his parish, uh, to protect his parish, that uh, something, it was some, something that basically, he said something that kind of implied the old calendarists and the new calendar, like the old calendarists were not the new calendar church, but um, this like, they took it as some sort of betrayal. The, the whole thing, to be quite honest, sounds made up. And uh, I think that they just really wanted a schism where Bishop Kyrikos would be in charge, and that's what they did. Okay. 
So that's the. I, I don't know what his position on the whole God the Father icons. I don't even know what that is. No, but, he uh, he he held the standard. I think he actually. His use, you can't have them if you want, but you don't have to have them. Yeah, but what? I think he kind of took it to the point where he kind of pushed for like anathematizing the Gregorians to solidify the schism altogether. Oh, so his view is that is it's it's his view is that you cannot have God the Father icons. No, he didn't take it to that extreme. He simply took it to the point where he was like, we need to anathematize these people. So the oh, point oh, is, so, so they anathematize those who say you have to have them. Right. Okay. And wow. so, you know, he basically made, he forced the position to be so stringent it couldn't allow um, reunion to take place. Because there were talks of potential reunion over the years, but it never happened. All right. Well, that's the that's basically the and, and of course the mainline Matthewites uh, had a, a metropole had a had a, the former Hodgkin priest, Father Anthony Gavalis. He be, he joined them and he became metropolitan Anthony Gavalis. That that was many years later. Now keep in yes. mind, Father Anthony actually and uh, we you know we actually knew him. He was a really kind man. And the point is, he refused when the Hocknessism happened to go along past Akakius and Gabriel. And when Akakius, when he finally just asked directly where should we go, and then he decided he went to the Matthewites. And he brought with him um, who then Father, uh, what was his name? Uh, well, Bishop Andre, but he was Father Michael Maklikov. And okay. he was with them as well. So the point is, this is a, that's a, an interesting thing that two bishops came from that, one of whom is now the bishop in Roack in the yeah. U.S., and one of Of course, there's, there was the famous, uh, what, the joke that Father, that Metro Anthony Gavalis made about, about, it's a good thing Hockner didn't have its location in, in uh, Miami or something. Oh, yeah, uh, uh, it was Orlando. Orlando, I'm sorry. <laughs> then it would be Holy Orthodox Metropolis of Orlando. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, in any case, so that, uh, you know, I think covers, you know, you have the, so basically you have three groups of Matthewites, uh, you know, and they've kind of, you know, with the Gregorians have splintered somewhat uh, further. And so mm -hmm. then you have basically the mainline Matthewites now under Archbishop Stephanos, who basically claim jurisdiction over Greece and whatever missionary territories and the Synod of Archbishop Kyrikos, which believes it is the one true synod left on earth and has put a bishop on every continent. Yes. Okay, so back to us. So some people are asking. We had in nineteen ninety seven. Oh, this continent. Sorry. Okay, yes. So in 1997, uh, our synod consecrated uh, two American bishops, uh, Archbishop John and Archbishop Hilarion. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you want to. You maybe maybe you want to say yeah, something. Yeah, basically, the, what it came down to was that in the um, in the early days of the 20th century, uh, a number of old Catholic groups had wanted to become Orthodox. And this was that was actually during the period shortly after Overbeck, where a lot of groups actually thought they were Orthodox. And so um, what ended up happening was uh, one of these uh, individuals, a Father William Francis Brothers, uh, who became, you know, he was actually fairly popular in Woodstock, um, in the area he was in. Uh, you know, built a church, they built a monastic community, and they referred to themselves as uh, Old Catholic Orthodox. Western Orthodox Old yeah, Catholics. Western Orthodox Old Catholics, exactly. And so what ends up happening is, uh, you know, there's a lot of history to this to unpack with just our American bishops, where you have, you're dealing with, uh, there was uh, Bishop Palladius Rodenko of the Ukrainian Church, um, and a whole bunch of other stuff. And it basically turned out that uh, in a, one of the elders, um, the, one of the last elders of uh, Valam, uh, was ended up living, you know, in various places in the U.S. and eventually ended up living at the Holy Transfiguration at the Holy uh, in Abbey in New Jersey. And event, he actually was kind of like he kind of pushed for this uh, impetus to go towards Milan. And so, you know, our you know our bishops who were not you know canonically part of the old calendar church or the true Orthodox church at the time, uh, submitted to re, uh, reconsecration by Metropolitan of Logios. Now, in fact, they were, now I should point out that it, when they were given Caritasia, they actually went through all the Caritas, all the Caritonia prayers. Exactly. All right. And they, in fact, even when they did the Caritasia prayer for Bishop with all the prayers, they actually had him read the confession of faith and everything. So that's really and the, the, the concept was that to do the everything, everything. Anyway, go ahead. No, no. What, what I was going to say is the next and then we had then they came back to America and they gave uh, they did the same thing for all their clergy. So right. technically, what should have what the what technically what Callistos was supposed to have done, I guess, to the Matthews, but never actually happened. Yeah. So basically, at that point, you know, the the history that you can talk about before 1997 is scattered and very interesting, but has 
marginally little to do with true orthodoxy in general, although they did uh, vote against any communion with uh, Constantinople in 1970. But past that... I mean, it would have been more kind of a conservative uh, conservative reactionary. Yeah, uh, you know, and so the point is, and that's... And then once they were received by Milan, they were given official status and recognition. And yes. they, you know, now initially, what happened is there was a two month period in which they were con after they were consecrated, in which they were uh, our sin Milan said it actually set them up as kind of this like temporary synod. Um, and after two months, they were to, they uh, what was happening is they just simply dissolved it. It was part of the agreement, right? Uh, and they fem formally joined our synod. I mean, I say our synod because technically that's our synod at the time. Yeah, it's our synod. It's literally yeah. our synod. Yeah. Exactly. Now, even though people, when we speak about our, there's a personal history aspect in which there's a there's another our, if you know what yeah. I mean. Okay. It's not um, a collective hour, it's a personal exactly. hour. Yeah, I'm talking about the canonical hour. Okay. The canonical Noster. Okay. okay. So then we have American bishops. And um, we have Archbishop Hilarion in Texas and Archbishop John in New Jersey. And basically, they kind of subsist and build up their missions. I mean, I'm speaking from now personal experience. Uh, in the United States. Uh, around 2000 or 2001, okay, uh, mention of Logius, uh, and this is kind of, this is the, kind of the problem that starts to happen with Metropon of Logius around, uh, kind of historically, but also around this time. Uh, he gets influenced by, uh, you know, people, uh, I got kind of like, he has a, an auxiliary bishop or something like that. Uh, and they become like really prominent and they can, you know, if, if you know what I'm trying to say, they can do a lot of stuff. They're like the right hand man. Okay. And if Logius is encouraged um, by several people to go to various uh, patriarchates, and this is, this is why it was controversial, obviously, and to say, you know, this is our position. Uh, you know, we, you know, everybody should accept the old calendar, be anti communical, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, that was, and, you know, maybe we can work out a deal based upon these principles, okay? Uh, and that happens for the first time, I think, in, like, 1990, late 1999, actually, not 2001, uh, with the uh, Georgian Patriarchate. Yeah. All right? Mm -hmm. And um, at that point, the Georgian Patriarchate had actually left the World Council of Churches. They actually, you know, and they had done all these things. And they were they were actually dealing with incursions of people who were going to basic Hakna. And yes. so, and uh, so, and so now, now the Georgian Patriarchate also then puts out a condemnation of ecumenism, which ironically is, I believe, uh, basically as based upon things we had already put out. Um, but anyway, they do this, okay. And uh, I don't know if you want to continue, Father. Well, at this point, Metropolitan of Logios attempts to reach out to see if they can establish communion or be placed under their protection, um, and it almost happens. Um, you know, they literally were. The bishops of the Milan Synod were literally on a plane to get received by the Georgian Patriarchate, and they received phone calls. The disaster um, would happen. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah at, at, indicating that the Patriarchate of Constantinople had discovered this and wanted to stop it. So that went nowhere, and that was left alone. And that was basically the last time that um, Milan tried to reach out to... Um, well, Rome. no, no, no. Rem remember, no. Remember, technically, I think, actually, what happened... Um, was that they then the Georgian Patriarchate and you know there was also supposedly Hilarion of New York or whatever. Well, this is and that's I was going to get to that. He was like, you should go to the other Patriarchates and ask them for kind of Pushed deal. by Hilarion of New York, and now this is where it gets interesting because now we really should tie into Rokor stuff because at this point, I mean, are we going to bring up when they tried to steal our church in Woodstock and they, they well, kind of? We don't have to bring the. We don't have to bring that up, but you just did. But I was uh, <laughs> I was actually. Uh, he sent a priest there. It's like, this is our church now. Yeah, this is, were, this is like in 1999 when this happened. I mean, yeah. So this is around the time that they're trying to like really collect whatever they can get off of. They, they, they I think it was, uh, when did they put, they tried to put the elder in a mental institution. But, yeah. They, yeah. They, well, they, it didn't work out because yeah. uh, basically the doctor's like, this guy's, he's, he's got his full mind and everything. Yeah. You can't just, I say, mean, and they, oh. maybe they did, they tried to do the same thing to Vitaly too, but you know, Vitaly well, that, well, that's what I was going to get to because it's just two years later that that's exactly what they did to Metropolitan Vitaly, which led to the first, um, you know, full blown internal Russian schism in the Rokor. Um, because at this point, the ecumenists in Rokor, who were definitely for union with the MP, were pushing uh, really hard for that to happen. 
and they were giving assurances that it would, so on and so forth. Now, Metropolitan Vitaly, for his, all his faults, um, wasn't a fan of you know just submitting to the Moscow Patriarchate. So what ends up happening is um, you know he finds out that they're trying to vote on you know the MPs social justice statements and stuff in 2000 um, in the 2001 uh, synod meeting and he says I, I want no part of this I'd rather retire so uh, within a day or two of realizing what has happened that now they're going to completely move towards union with the um, union with the Moscow Patriarchate uh, he renounces his retirement and so immediately begins to contact, there were a number of what were known as Stavropagil parishes and properties, which were actually organized, um, which were under the obedience to the Metropolitan. And so they immediately, um, they immediately, there were a lot of people who were protesting, like there were three monks in Jordanville, uh, who became famous in writing a letter about why they could not join the MP and the ecumenism in the MP. And those three, uh, three monks eventually became bishops in the Rokor uh, under Metropolitan Vitali, which had now split off. The Rocor in New York was, at this point, they sent, they managed to get Metropolitan Vitali to a mental institution. I remember uh, there was even video of, you know, Bishop Michael. You can find it on YouTube. You can find video of, you can find of, the video of, of the Mansonville of confrontation. Metropolitan Vitali, because I know that that, well, that no, was... there There's a video of a Mansonville confrontation where somebody comes from Rocor headquarters. Yeah, that was when they literally dragged Metropolitan Vitali to the mental hospital. Well, Vitali comes down from the stairs and starts like, yeah, what's going on like, here? Oh, he's like, what's going on here? You know, and they, they, that, that's what they were, that's when they grabbed him. And so the point is, I remember that like it was yesterday. And so, you know, a lot of people were concerned about him um, when they when it first started, when they were in the Synod building. And this is how things just start to tie together. Um, when they at this point, a father, Vladimir Shishkov, eternal memory to him, uh, is in New Jersey and had already left when Bishop Gregory Grabe joined from Rogue was it, wasn't he like a, was he a son-in-law of Bishop Gregory or yeah, something? He was a son-in-law of Bishop Gregory. Yeah. And the point is, he went to Roac, which had we've talked about Roac in the and past. Bishop Gregory but, was a part of Roac before he died. Yeah, he, he joined before his death, and so Father Vladimir was part of Roac, and he was actually the only priest that was known of at the time who was actually commemorating Metropolitan Valentine in the U.S. But Metropolitan Valentine would occasionally visit America. Every year he would go there and he'd go to Father Vladimir's house and so on and so forth. So when the 2001 thing happened, the, the synod meeting where Metropolitan Vitali unretired himself and then they try to lock him up in the synod building in New York, what ends up happening is that Metropolitan Valentine hears about this. And so he says, well, why don't we just take a cab and get him and we'll just take him home? So Metropolitan Valentine gets in a car uh, with Father Vladimir um, he had already, you know, Todd Gregory of Colorado had already wormed his way into the ROAC and was basically like, you know, like basically like Metropolitan Valentine was like, well, it looks good. He has a great looking monastery. Look at these icons. Like, he should be a bishop. So, you know, I mean, I hate to say that sometimes bishops can be that superficial, but yeah, it can happen. Um, so the point is, uh, so they go and they literally rescue Metropolitan Val uh, Metropolitan Vitaly and they take him up. Metropolitan Vitaly is not a fan of. of Gregory well, wait a second. Well, I'm, uh, just so I'm clear, what prevented the? I mean, did they just walk into uh, the Senate headquarters? And they, I think there what anybody? happened is they because Metropolitan Vitaly had a caretaker named Ludmilla, and basically she didn't know what to do because there were no options. So when they came, they called Ludmilla, and they're like, "Oh, we're downstairs." So she just kind of ushered Vitaly downstairs really fast, and nobody knew what was happening because the Senate didn't suddenly expect Metropolitan Valentino Susdal to show up in a cab to pick up Metropolitan Vitaly. It just wasn't in their their frame of reference. It, it was like they weren't really expecting that one coming. So yeah, because the, technically they had declared uh, what him to be sus suspended. Yeah, systematic, and they they and in Russia they weren't expecting him to be in New York. So effectively, you know, he goes and he takes Metropolitan Vitaly to Canada, where you know Metropolitan Vitaly lived and he had his ski. And so that is how the Rocor V eventually was born. And there was even talk of union, and of course, you know, folks like Gregory of Colorado made sure that didn't happen. But um, the you know the point is that at this point that was where the Rocor V began to form, and unfortunately it was also where the Rocor V began to split, because at this point um, what happens is Lazar and Benjamin, um, bishops Lazar and Benjamin, who Ash, was, that's Archbishop Lazar Zerbinko of Odessa, correct? yes, correct. And so the, these two bishops who actually were involved in the formation of the Free Russian Church and then left and rejoined Rocor left again 
to join Metropolitan Vitaly. And Agaf- I think Bishop Agafango joined them for like nine months or something. And then he like left, uh, went back to Rokor, uh, to the Rokor, which would become the Rokor and P until the very last day. And so what ends up happening is um, the uh, at this point, uh, Lazar, Bishop Lazar and Benjamin claim to have a document from Metropolitan Vitaly uh, stating that they were allowed to reform their church in Russia. And this is immediately disputed by the Rokor V. They're like, oh, we don't believe that's a legitimate document. And it's at this point that there is a, I forget the name of the, name of the uh, Spanish. Hold on, well, I'm, oh, hold on I'm, sorry, I'm just so I can, I'm not confused here. Because um, I'm always confused about the whole Mansonville, Rokor yeah. V, and, and La- Arshav Lazar Dravinko stuff. Yep. Okay, so, so did Metropolitan Vitaly acknowledge Arshav Lazar Dravinko and Bishop Benjamin as being in his communion? The document was produced when Metropolitan Vitaly was almost on his deathbed. So, <laughs> so before that, he was not. He did not consider himself in communion with him, or did no, no, no. He considered them as bishops of his synod. Oh, okay, okay. But then they presented this document from Metropolitan Vitaly. And it was a Father Alexander uh, Iwasevich in Argentina who had joined with uh, the Rokor V temporarily and then eventually went to back to the Rokor MP or the Rokor at the time and uh, said that um, on Metropolitan Vitaly's desk there were stacks of pre-signed papers. Now, this was an accusation that was put against Archbishop Accentius as well with lower orders. But the point is it called into question whether or not this document that bishops Lazar and benjamin were presenting was authentic and so ultimately that became uh you know a point of contention but at that point the rocor vitali and the artok began to kind of split okay so this and, is this is this is the because there's also supposedly a document by mitchell and vitali before he died about he doesn't recognize right the consecrations and of archbishop exactly. tikon and, and, and et cetera, et cetera, is, you know it becomes unclear as to what metropolitan vitali was actually what whose side he was really on and so well, maybe he was just an older fellow in the last few days. They could just make him sign anything. I mean, that's uh, well, unfortunately, possible. and they had pre-signed documents already. So how hard would it be to tell, you know, they, you know, it, it seemed like at that point it was a matter of, you know, I hate to say this, but it was a matter of talking to his handlers to get what you want. Um, you know, the first of whom was, you know, Lyudmila, who was his loyal servant. But at the same time, some always suspected she was the power behind the throne. And, you know, it becomes one of those things where you just don't know. But in any case, Artok uh, then, you know, was now a real thing. And um, so you had Artok, you have the Rokor. Now, the question, though, is why did Archbishop Blazer Javinko, why didn't he try to, let's say, have a reconciliation with, let's say, Met Roak? Why did he want, why did he think it was necessary to have his, an, 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 his own Senate? What was the rationale behind that? I don't know. Okay. Um, and I don't, I don't even make that assumption. I have no idea what to think. But in any case, the good of it was that they did make the Serbian true Orthodox bishops. Um, so that is a plus. And Although they're not in communion with each other now. They're not in communion with each other now. But they, the point is, the job of the bishops is to serve their flocks. And as much as, if, if one thing should be clear from anyone who's listened through this long, tortured broadcast, it is that at times the flocks are not put over personal vendettas and fights. But um, in any case, so now our talk exists um, and there's still a large contingent in Rokor that do not believe that they're going to join the Moscow Patriarchy. So you have the Rokor Vitali, which is now also split into three factions because then Archbishop Anthony or Bishop Anthony, another uh, father in California was made a bishop and he splits off and forms his own jurisdiction which then forms a bunch of other jurisdictions, and uh, Metropolitan Vitaly's original group, um, basically, if I remember correctly, I forget who they're who's in charge of them now. But well, some of those people left and joined uh, the GOCK in America. I know, like some of them did leave and join. I thought Stephen Allen had been part of, I think that, and then he left and joined the GOCK, and there were a few others too. Yeah, so. and so, um, but what ends up happening? So, in um, that, the main branch of the um, of the Russian Church abroad under the Archbishop is, um, I guess uh, now it's a uh, Archbishop Vladimir of, I guess San Francisco, and they have a bunch of bishops in Russia. So ironically, most of the Rokor parishes that um, have formed since, um, or have been in Russia, not here. And so uh, you know that. Okay, but, but the mainline Rokor, mainline is, Rokor, basically, what's, what's going on in two thousand two with him? Two thousand two, there's still people who are just 
true believers in Rokor. They're absolutely not going to join with the Moscow Patriarchate. They can't possibly believe it's happening. Meanwhile, you have a bunch more people who are now like, yes, we're joining the Moscow Patriarchate tomorrow, blah, blah, blah. And this kind of battle goes back and forth until 2007. And once you get to 2007, which is the year of the Union, at that point, it becomes painfully obvious that the Rokor is going to join with the MPs. So the last group of people, they, they, we're talking the last bunch here, you know, basically begin collecting around Bishop Agafangal of Odessa, uh, who had, you know, been involved with the Free Russian Church and had been involved with Metropolitan. He was actually Vitaly. consecrated a bishop by Mishmon Vitaly during the, uh, during the uh, when he was, when Roak actually formed. So, yeah. so but then the he was Lord, received back as a bishop by Rokor. He was basically like, I'm the last line of defense here. So basically, 2007 comes, the Union comes, and he says, no, we're not going with it. And all the remaining parishes that are left that are against the MP leave to join with Metropolitan Agrofangal of Odessa. Well, and, and Bishop Daniel of uh, Erie was opposed to it, but he ultimately said, I'm, not, I'm, I'm opposed to it, but I'm not going to do anything. Yeah, and then he died. So yeah. in any case, the point is that um, – now, the Rokor had broken communion with the Synod and Resistance. And with Back in 2006, Earth. right? Yeah, in 2006. So they immediately... Although, interestingly, help. remember, I jump in here, the Synod and Resistance actually offered to help Vitaly. Yeah, they did. They and did. Was, and, 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 and then and it was... That, uh, way he, that way he wouldn't have turned to Bishop Benjamin or Archbishop Lazar, but... Uh, he ultimately, that I guess, they, the, the to get that. Is a lot of them rejected that because they rejected the whole Kyprianism thing. Mm -hmm. And so... They kind of rejected that, but in the case of Rokor A, and you know the uh, Rokor under um, Metropolitan Agafangal, they basically uh, they reestablished that communion, uh, so they could make bishops, and they made new bishops, and then Rokor A split again uh, about three what three years ago with uh, uh, the the uh, uh, the arch there the Sophronius St. Petersburg, and I think of Dionysius. There was an Archbishop Andronic. Well, was Archbishop Andronic, and he ended up, he actually, his motivation was good. And the motivation was good. Arch, uh, Bishop, Archbishop Stefan Sabelnik, who was of the Artok, uh, decided to reach out to other Rokor bishops. And he reached out to Archbishop Andronic, and they actually consecrated another well, bishop. The, yeah. the problem, though, of course, is that the Rokor A's position is that there's only one true Rokor. And to say that there could other be other true Orthodox churches that are true churches, but because of circumstances we're not in communion with, they're like opposed to saying that they're saying that, well, that's, and, that's, and that's been the, the ridiculous position that they've held. Which, and I'm going to how say does that make any sense with the, with going into communion with the Polinico Synod? Then you know that's kind of problematic. You know, well, the point is, they, well, that union was that union was. Uh, but you see my point that that's then going into communion with a church they had not been in communion with previously. So I'm, I'm just well, saying that the not the problem is that I, I the bigger problem is that I see here is that the in many cases. The Rokor schisms that exist seem to be out of personal pride because all of these people were involved with each other, so to pretend that they weren't is just nonsensical. Maybe they all don't like each other. Maybe that's it. Well, that's what I guess so, but that's a stupid reason to be out of pride. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, and, so, and we're the first to say that, kids. Um, but in any case, so that leaves us... Although technically, let me be... Uh, this is my own opinion for what sure. it's worth, Father Joseph. Oh. Even if you don't like your metropolitan, your first hierarch, but he's not a heretic, you cannot cease commemoration of him. There yeah. are other ways to do it, and I don't. I, I'm not. I, I know, you know. I don't approve of people just saying, "Well, we can run the synod better." Well, and, it's a very and, and metropolitan fact. or archbishop so and so is is trying to act to is not acting correctly. Therefore, we're going to cease commemoration of him because the canons give only one reason for ceasing commemoration of your first hierarch, and that is if he's teaching public heresy condemned by the holy councils of the holy fathers uh, and this is also one of the prop one one of the bigger problems i hate to say this that we've seen in true orthodoxy is a lack of accountability because all it takes is for a priest who gets legitimately condemned by his authority to turn around and say well uh, this guy's a secret heretic and that's the reason i'm leaving blah 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 gives a very good reason and then well, but that's why the canon was promulgated because it has to be public and clear, yeah, it can't just be secretly he said this because yeah, but we but we we do know of church peripatetics, and you know that there have been you know clergy who have been through four or five synods, and that's it's that's a sad situation, and if you.
discover that in a clergyman's personal history, it's it's probably a good sign to run. And this is one of the other things that's important because we talk to people mostly who are new to orthodoxy, and that's part of the reason we did this show, just to throw out the confusion out there so you know it. But for people who are already in a true orthodox synod, you really have to have a good reason to switch. And that reason should be heresy. So, you know, a lot of this, a lot of the confusion that exists comes from not following the canons, not following their letter, not following their spirit. And ironically, we're still, if you take all the true orthodox, we're still the ones following the canons most properly because you can't point to the canonical churches, which are an absolute mess, if you want to call them canonical at all. So the point is, we're literally in the shipwreck that St. Basil's talking about. And so few people want to actually recognize that. Okay, so that's Greece. Now, what about Russia? Oh boy. Um, well, we did talk some about Russia because we talked about Russia abroad. But if you're going, we you have to start. I guess you have it's, to start. It's got some you, overlap with the uh, with the two other episodes we did about this. But let's go ahead and go ahead. Yeah, th th that's there is kind of overlap here, and so we we can actually I, since we talked about the the schisms and breaking in Rocor, um, effectively, you know, you you have to deal with two main streams in Russia, and those are the streams of people that you know claim heritage from the Rokor and the streams of people who claim heritage from the Catacomb Church. <clears throat> and this, um, I know that, for example, our, our Russian Synod was uh, composed of an initiative group which brought together disparate groups of people, some of them of questionable canonicity, some of them of the Catacombs, including some Seraphimogenidites. And they basically said, we're just going to resolve this and clarify, you know, like they, I think they actually, if I remember correctly, they all did mutual genethysias on each other or something. No, 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 <laughs> no. I don't that, know no, what it was. No, no, no. But no. Whatever, whatever the case may be, they all... That would be entered. funny if that happened, but that's not what happened. Yeah, I don't know what happened. All I know is they resolved all their problems. And then, and the at that time, the Rokor, Bishop Lazar, was, his incursions were basically saying that the catacombics didn't really, weren't real bishops. Yes, yes. well, remember, see, as we covered in the uh, program about the real men, White, and a few other ones. Yeah. Um, once uh, the once Sergius takes over, and most of the uh, Russian bishops are basically executed because they won't go along with Sergius, you have a group of people of Russian bishops and priests that form what we call the True Orthodox Church of Russia. All right, that's what they call themselves. Uh, commonly called the Catacomb Church, also. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, they continue to exist into basically right up into the 1980s. Uh, however, problems began to show up where accusations between catacomb groups began to arise in the basically 50s and 60s and such. Mm -hmm. Because that we get, you know, there's the whole Seraphim Ogenidai question. I mean, everybody kind of says Bishop Gennady was a good man, but the question is, was Seraphim really the was was the guy who was claiming to be Bishop Seraphim the real Bishop Seraphim, or is he some kind of like, you know, con man who was, I guess, wanting to get tortured or something like yeah, that? Yeah, con, con men who love con men who love getting tortured it's exactly for claiming to be Bishop and getting beat to death and such. Anyway, so people were saying, oh, he's really a KGB agent. Claim, I mean, they were actually claiming he's an NKV or KGB agent. Oh, that, that who, um, Lazar or, or Sarah? Uh, I, I think there was another group. There was like the Aunt, the uh, Theodosians or something like that. Um, there was another group that was that was descended. So there's this archbishop, what Gregory or uh, Anthony, who was consecrated back in the mid 20s. Okay, Anthony uh, and, uh, Galitzin, I think. I think so. He was, or he had originally been a member of like one of the Soviet committees against and on anti-religious activity, but he actually had a genuine conversion of what everybody says. Okay, and uh, he uh, was consecrated. We know this for a fact. He was consecrated by Saint Tikhon. Everybody acknowledges that. And then he kind of like subsists in various uh, outward communities thereafter. Okay, so. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm almost spent my energy just talking about the whole Greek situation as it is. Yeah, but, um, the, okay, so, uh, okay. I mean, the rush is a little, I mean, it probably would be, I mean, it's a little bit less, less complicated. Yeah. Although maybe not. I, do, I just don't know the I think history. overall it would be less complicated if we, if you divide Okay, it so you have, you have several catacomb groups, Seraphim Aginidites, you have the Theodosians. You have at least two or three the others. I believe. Catacombics. Who exactly. Eventually, yeah. Well, remember, technically, uh, a lot of times, the, some of the peasants in the in the Soviet countryside weren't even required to have passports into the 1970s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, some of them, you could subsist as being passportless in the countryside for some time you know, because they didn't want to accept the passport because the concept was that this is the Soviet regime as Antichrist and it's like, is it the mark of the beast, you know? Yeah. So, 
what happens is that there was a uh, this is when we get to our Shablaza Javinko, and of course I don't want to I'm just going to give the I'm trying to give the the fair history because I know people have different negative and positive feelings of Archbishop Lazar. Um, but he was originally ordained, as I recall, a, a deacon in the Moscow Patriarchate and yeah. a priest in the he Moscow was, He was of the catacomb family, and then he was yeah. ordained in the Moscow Patriarchate. Well, the Theodosians say he wasn't a catacomb family. He just made that up. Oh, but, okay. of course, that's the problem, though. All right? Uh, everybody kind of says these things about each other. So it's very difficult. You know, anyway... Um, I might be wrong about that if I'm if I'm wrong. Well, the only reason, the only reason, and I'm going to be honest with you, Father, I am suspicious of Archbishop Lazar, and the reason I say that is because during his activity with the Free Russian Church, it seemed that his activities were more destructive and rebuilding okay. than yeah. they were serving. Okay, so let, let's explain. So, uh, he there's two stories. One is that there was a catacomb elder that said, "Yes, I recommend you know you go to the Moscow Patriarchate to be ordained." but then come back to the catacomb church after that. And there's another story that says, no, the elder so-and-so, whatever his name was, would never have told him that, whatever, you know? So Father Lazar is made a higher monk, a higher deacon than higher monk in the Moscow Patriarchate. And then he does begin through some uh, circuitous route through, I guess, the Russian monastery in Mount Athos or some of the Russian mon monks from Mount Athos to exchange letters through these routes. Because, you know, people had ways of getting letters out of the Soviet Union. Yeah. It was difficult, but you could do it. I mean, I mean, it wasn't completely sealed off uh, with the row with the row core. And uh, as I believe, what happens is that either is around 1981, row core sends Bishop was it Barnabas or Benjamin? I can't remember which one. Uh, the one he's row course. Okay, yeah, Barnabas of Canes or something yeah, like that. The Varnava, yeah, yeah. He sends Bishop Varnava into Moscow, and in a hotel room. With Father Dmitri Dudko as the witness, I guess they presumably they do a, a, a liturgy. At least they presume they do a liturgy, and then they do a, a single hand consecration. Right. Or Bishop Vernava does. I'm assuming he just didn't do just didn't. No, have but it was done with the blessing of the synod, so it's not yeah. a typical single hand. Ah, consecration. exactly. So then at that point, Bishop uh, Lazar is like, I am the only canonical bishop because Bishop Lazar's point was that there aren't. Uh, you know, he was when he he was giving reports throughout the 80s that there are no valid catacomb hierarchies left. Uh, that that no one has, uh, and that only everybody has to submit to Bishop Lazar for ordination, if they've not been. But he would accept ordination in the Moscow Patriarchate because he technically he always believed the Moscow Patriarchate had valid sacraments, ostensibly up until his death. Uh, but at least in, in I know by 2000 or so he did believe that. Okay, which is also why people have all kinds of negative views about this and that. Okay. Yeah. So, um, but technically, some of the Seraphimogenites believe the same thing. There's there's various explanations as to why they they believe this and all the rest. All right, because some groups will point to a catacomb group that said there was no grace in the Soviet Patriarchate, and another will say, well, catacomb group. Another catacomb group says, oh, there actually is, but you can't use it unless you know something like that. All right. Uh, so, this is when, as you pointed out, some of the chaos begins to happen. Uh, and around in 1989, I believe, he actually is able to get out of the Soviet Union. He goes to uh, the Royal Court Center headquarters, Bishop of uh, 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 Lazar Shabinko. And as I understand, they actually do give him a care to see it. They actually do do something like that. So no one questions his, his, his consecration after that. Uh, that's I've, I've been I've been told that. Um, I mean, it would make sense because if they wanted him to be like their representative. And what happens is that uh, Bishop Lazar, uh, or then Archie Lazar, I guess, says that all these catacomb nicks, they're, maybe they're sincere people, but they don't really have valid priesthood unless they're made in the Moscow Patriarchate. And he, his view is that the Seraphim Gennadites were basically, Gennady may have been a, 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 a genuine man, but Seraphim was a fake. And therefore, uh, I mean, I, you're, you're, you're ascribing to a much kinder language. Than yeah, you're right. He may have said, oh, Gennady was evil or something like that. I, I think mean, he called them frauds. Yeah, exactly. But my point is that. Yeah, I guess he called him frauds. I guess you know, yeah, uh, but to me, it, to me, but to me, even if I believe that, I couldn't call people who were genuinely suffering for orthodoxy to be frauds, even if they were they got a, a wrong ordination. If you don't, know well, I, I, I and that's I, I just would not, I would so not treat different. them like that. You know, yeah, and what ends up happening is you have cases of catacomb priests who have been taking care of their parishes for years. In one case, I think one was like two or three decades. And uh, he ends up ripping his cassock in church because he's like the real core bishop has declared I'm not a priest. Yeah, and but then, so, because at that point, all the chrismations are considered invalid and on all the rest, you know, everything. I mean, that's and, and so all these catacomb parishes basic. And then the Seraphim Aginidite reaction is a lot of them basically are like, well, then real core is obviously compromised. Something's wrong with them. Yeah. 
and so and they, had, and they and, and, up and, 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 and he even had one what one group went to Hakna Bishop Guri. Yeah, uh, he was a leader he of actually, one of the groups. He actually went to, if I remember correctly, he actually went to the Synodal Cathedral in New York and realized how uh, how tied in certain people there were with the Moscow Patriarch, which is why he went to Boston afterwards. Yes. So uh, that's so. What happens is the Seraphim again, like essential, as I understand, kind of break off, and they don't want to have any. Some of them submit to the re, the full new chrismations and reordinations or whatever, but a lot of them don't. Um. Archbishop Lazar. Then Rokor consecrates what uh, Father Archimandrite uh, Valentin Rustinov, right? Is right. Rustinov was his last Rustentov. name. Rustinov. Yeah, he was a, basically well known as kind of a cook before that, but he was also yeah, he was like a, he was like a celebrity chef in the Soviet period. Yeah, but he was he was still a Rokor Archimandrite. And he was he was rather interesting because he was able to get control of like relics from what Saint Euphrasy from this old anti-religious museum that was like closing down yeah, or something. He was also able to he was also able to re-register churches during this period. Yeah, because there were a lot of old abandoned churches and he would go to the Moscow Patriarch of Bishop and say, look, do you want this property? And if not, can is there a way I can purchase it from yeah, you? I don't think like he that. actually even went through the, the um the What did he go through a secretary or something? He went through that yeah, because it, it was like went to a that. property secretary and he just re registered them under the names of the Free Russian Church. Well he had to get them to sign off and not acknowledging anymore, right? Or did they No, not I don't think he did. Okay. I don't, I think it went literally through the Ministry of Justice. And so he was made a bishop in nineteen ninety, as I recall. Yeah. Uh and I, there were some other groups of people made bishop in nineteen ninety as, as yeah, well, yeah. ninety one, ninety two, et cetera. And they made um, more bishops and exactly. so on. So and then, of course, you, yeah, so then, then you have the Free Russian Church, which is basically the Rokor in the Rokor in Russia. Mm -hmm. That's strange that the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia, inside of Russia, which is that, they make sounds. jokes about that. Yeah. Yes. So in Rokor at this point, uh, there have been several people have made this point. Vladimir Moss has made it. Others that Rokor did not really want to restore the Russian Church inside of Russia. They wanted to have subservient bishops inside of Russia doing whatever they wanted. Yeah, uh, and the problem is that that's simply not that was not the commission given by Saint Tikhon and the Russian bishops to what the bishop, the free bishops should come and do after communism collapses, um, because it puts you in the weird canonical situation of saying the Metropolitan of New York has primacy over the Metropolitan of Susa, who's what like eighteenth in the hierarchy of the yeah. old Russian Church or something like that, you know. So this comes to a head in ninety four. Uh, and, and stop me if I'm wrong here, Father Joseph, where the Roak bishops basically say that uh, Rokor, it's nice, we can, we can be in communion with you, assuming everything is all right, but you don't really have any authority to run the church inside of Russia because we are the church inside of Russia. Yeah, well, they attempted to illegally depose Valentin um, that year as well. And so that was part was of that the, before was was that pro, was that I was ar actually around the same time like they were issuing these documents and then the Rokor said we'd like to have a meeting with you and then he realized that it was a, like an attempt to depose him. Oh, I've got deja vu and Archie worked into us. So. Yeah, and so in any case, um, you know, but he manages to you know the the church obviously manages to survive and that's what we know as Roak today. Okay, but what was the what was their 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 reason for claiming he had to be deposed? Disobedience to the synod, if I remember correctly. But what was he just? How was he disobedient? Well, because the idea, the very idea that Russia could govern itself was, I think, uh, like horrifying. So by bringing that subject up, that was itself disobedience. Exactly. Okay. So, uh, so that that then the rope basically at that point, I think almost all the free Russian bishops go with Valentin initially. Even Lazar does. Yeah, they did, and Agafangal, and then yes. they. Well, Agafangal was actually made and, and made during the so-called Suzdale schism. Yeah, uh, it, which is interesting. And then um, he, he fled to the Rokor, exactly. and so did and then uh, Lazar Zubanko. By '96, Lazar Archbishop Lazar is back in Rokor too, and, and Bishop Benjamin. Yeah, because Archbishop Lazar gives this famous interview, which is uh, they used to keep on the old Ro uh, old um, what is it, uh, Orthodox uh, Rokor. There's this old Rokor site they used to run. I I got a link to an NFT article somewhere because I was afraid someone would try to take it down, and I got like archived and everything. Yeah. In which the ask and Lazarus is like, well, I believe the Moscow Patriarchate has grace, and we don't commune with them, but you know we don't say they don't. They, we, we say they have valid sacraments. It's like almost not Kiprianite, but it's it's kind of like the old not not well thought out Rokor position. Which, yeah, you know, but this, is, this is also kind and of. Remember, like Archbishop Lazarus was, was one of his one of his uh, one of um, one of his supporters was in fact Archbishop Anthony of Los Angeles, of uh, Geneva. And that that's one thing that makes me think about the agent angle. The other thing is that he seems to always be in the middle of things. He's in the middle of the schism with Metropolitan Vitaly, jumps back to Rokor. 
But isn't there a more logical? Ex but isn't there a simpler, less? Uh, isn't the explanation is that he simply liked to be in the middle of stuff, and he kind of did cause problems. He's just that kind of person, isn't that? Is that? Uh, uh, yeah, well, yeah. We could we could ascribe to incompetence as opposed to mendacity, but the point is because I don't want to. I'm not going to even if that's the case. He still was, I think, a true bishop. Yeah. Okay. You know what I mean. So I mean, my point is that he his consecration wasn't invalid, even if he was a secret agent or something like that. If you know what I'm trying to say. Well, yeah, but if he was a secret agent, then what's the? I mean, technically, at that point, if what would be well, the difference between him and him and an MP bishop? Well, the difference would be that he wasn't. The, well, I'd say the difference was that publicly, he wasn't claiming to be anything. He wasn't. Well, that's, okay, that's, and that's he fair. wasn't. He wasn't supporting the Soviet authorities. I mean, when someone is a secret heretic and they're consecrated by the church. There's okay, no, that's, that's a fair argument. You see my point? The church would yeah. still accept their consecration, but if they come out as public heretic, then you got a different issue going mm -hmm. on, all right? Um, and and the, reason, okay. the reason is there are a lot of good ROAC people, and I don't want to, like, throw them under the bus. Well, you're not throwing ROAC under the bus. I would R talk. I mean, R talk. Because Archie Lazar, like, proposed back in, what, 2004, 2005? Yeah, you don't want to throw like everything on him, too. You know? Yeah, I mean, I mean, there were other people uh, involved around it. It wasn't just him running everything. And in fact, wrote, wrote, Artok made a point in 2008 of trying to like anathematize Kyprianism and trying to clear up some of these these issues. Uh, and then that caused some issues back in 2009. You have the Ishvesh, I think Ishvesh clergy or something like that, where they went to Archbishop Tikhon and they're like, we can't accept the no grace position of the Moscow Patriarchate. Mm -hmm. And so there's this 2009 document from Archbishop Tikhon, a Pashinek, I believe his last name was, and which Archbishop Tikhon is like, well, um, you can he he gave like this position where you can say the MP has valid sacraments, but they ha but you can't you still can't go to them. You can say the MP has no valid sacraments, but you still can't go to them. And you can say that you don't know, but you still can't go to them. All right. So that was kind of his initial position, and then that later turned into a whole controversy, which by 2016 erupted into basically you know Lesna con the Lesna convent leading leaving Artok. Um, you know, there's there's that whole situation about. Which is kind of a partial fallout from the whole grace question. and attempt to clear, clarify that up in our time. I think Roak what anathematized Kyprianism in two thousand eight or something like that, right? Yeah. Uh, so yeah. The, so the problem was that just because you anathematize Kyprianism, people are assuming that's just a blanket. Oh, that just means you that, that you anathematize anybody who says there's grace in the patriarchate. So the problem is that not everybody interpreted that like that. Some people interpreted we're anathematizing the methodology in the thought of Kyprian, but not necessarily the conclusions. All right. And a lot of people want it, or, or, or prefer to phrase it like that because then you'd have to say, well, with Rokor, and if Rokor went into communion with Kiprinos, and remember, when they went into communion with, communion with the sin resistance in 94, and Rokor did, uh, Kiprinos had translated, uh, or uh, Chris Ostrom, whoever had translated into Russian and English his ecclesiological position paper, and it was given to all the Rokor bishops and mm -hmm. to, to other people. So they yeah, read that. Gregory Grabe was. Exactly. Uh, was so that. he was the only one who basically said, I can't accept this. But he was already on the outs anyway, all right? So my point is that you can't just say, well, Rokor didn't understand what was happening, and they just went and communed with condemned heretics not understanding anything. I mean, well, did they not, well, did they not read the mind that, and But now, he, that, now this, again, points out, because you have to deal with the question of, you know, say, for example, Metropolitan Petrus of Astoria, who held a similar ecclesiological position to exactly. Metropolitan Cyprian. And, and when he what, asked, exactly, I'm sorry, go ahead. And he was in communion with the Rokor Synod. So when, you know, the... the it, well, remember, you know, in Metro and Petros' case, yeah, in, in Petros' case, he did not agree to sign the, the 1973 encyclical of the True Orthodox Church of Greece under Archbishop Byzantius, which said that the new calendars were definitively, they have no grace and you have to receive my chrismation, okay? And he was like, he went to Rokor bishops, and you can look on the YouTube documentary on Metro and Petros, and, and they talk about this. In which, uh, and it's not like this is some scandal, or whatever. Metron Petros, uh, or Archer, Archer Petros at the time, Archer Peter, uh, uh, he went to the Rokor bishops and he said, Should I sign this encyclical? And they said, No, don't sign it. We do not agree with it. We're in communion with them, but we don't agree with this no grace position. Okay? So then he says, He tells the Senate in Greece, I'm not going to sign it. At which point, what happens? The Senate in Greece suspends him. Okay? And then he goes back to Rokor and he says, well, what should I do? And Rokor's like, well, we can't have anything to do with you because you're suspended. But isn't that kind of hypocritical? They were the ones who told him to do what got him suspended. But yet well, they not no, do with But them. the reason I find that interesting is because for all the condemnations of Kyprianism, he was restored to communion with the, you know, the Senate of Archbishop Chrysostom after the, you know, the attempted deposition of Archbishop Accentius. And he was, and and was also, never he was, brought up. And also, if you look at the documentary and you look at it's very interesting. He point out that the last two or three years of his life, 
when he was even like a, I guess when he went back into commune with, I'm not sure if he was in commune with Kirk, the Chris, Chris Austin. Yeah, he was. But, but he was also technically Rokor allowed him to go to Jordanville and celebrate liturgy and do things in Jordan and can celebrate yeah. with him. No, I know. So it was this weird situation. Rokor's like, we don't make any decisions about any of these uh, Greek old calendar groups. But I guess Petros is all right. You know? I mean, I guess they, they owed him that since they basically put him in that situation to begin with. Um, to begin with, you know, basically yeah. by telling him to do this. And anyway, so at this point, um, um, so that's the situation in Russia. Um, some of the groups, again, we have the Seraphim Aginidites, and then basically you have a lot of them are like, well, we have to get her to, and this is, let's be frank, a lot of them are like, we have to get some sort of ordination that somebody recognizes. And I don't know what, this is the, this is kind of, a, I think, a legitimate criticism of Seraphim Aginidite, at least their thought. Um, and they basically would turn to, for example, uh, Kievan Patriarch of Bishops who were based, you know, and well, technically some of the Kievan Patriarch of Bishops were like on the outs with, with, um, well, that was, how, that was how our, our Russian Synod was formed. Yes. And basically they were, they had some of their bishops who were on the outs with, uh, Philaret since basically well, there's, no, it was before Philaret because it was 1990. Yeah. yeah. Well, there were, there were three sets of consecrations of reconsecrations because in the, over, over this issue. And, and the last happened by this Georgian dissident Archbishop Ambrose Katsambi, I think, or something. Uh, who was uh, made a Georgian bishop back in the 60s, and he uh, basically reconsecrated a number of them back in 2005. Okay, hold on. I just have to show this comment because I just have to. I mean, I can't, I can't. <laughs> is it a bad comment or a funny comment? Uh, well, it's on the screen, but... Uh, okay, read it to me. I'm not looking at it. Man, I'm about an hour in, and this makes my head spin. Uh, I, 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 agree. Too. I agree. I'm not... <laughs> now, now, let me be frank, and this is what I... And before people, like, oh, do their little chuckle and their laugh about, oh, the schismatic vagantes and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I can go I can go through 4th century church history of what happened in the East, and it's just as complicated. Yeah. This is... If you read St. Basil's On the Holy Spirit, the last part of it, he, and he talks about the night battles and everybody attacking each other, even though they should believe the same thing, he's talking about what exactly was happening to the Orthodox bishops in the East, who could all agree they were anathematizing the Arians, but they all were deposing each other for either from basically made up heresies or they claimed somebody had been in communion with somebody who had been a heretic or something like that. For example, uh, like St. Basil, and one there was one occasion in which St. Basil the Great was at this like dinner party that like some local governor had thrown, was having, and like these two monks came up and they almost like spit in his face and they said, you know, Basil's a heretic. And his view is, why am I a heretic? And he said, well, you were ordained by somebody who was ordained by somebody who was in communion with Achacius. Achacius was the tongue of the Arians, all right? Now, I think his claim was that, well, they didn't, those bishops weren't, hadn't clearly made a decision for Achacius, but they hadn't condemned him or something like that. I'm not exactly sure, all right? It's the same thing that people threw in the face of St. Miletus of Antioch, all right? Well, and, and this is, I mean, saints even attacked each other. Oh, well, uh, yeah, St. Jerome, you have to look at what St. Jerome said. For example, St. Jerome never accepted St. Carol of Jerusalem as being a, a valid yeah. or legitimate bishop. In fact, is, it wasn't until John of Jerusalem that he finally accepted a valid bishop of Jerusalem. And even then, he started to break communion with John of Jerusalem. And that's why he was like, I'm only going to be in communion with the Bishop of Rome since he's my original bishop, which is why the papists kind of omit the whole context of that yeah, letter. They leave that, they leave that part out to make it look like it's just pure obedience to the Pope. And but you look, you look at look at for example in Antioch, you had the, the single hand consecration of uh, Saint Paulinus of Antioch, who was a saint with many martyrologies, even though he was inimical, yeah. very inimical to Saint Melius. Luciferus of Cagliari, who was, supp was supposed to wait for Saint Eusebius of Vercelli. But Luciferus was so hot headed, he was like, I'm not going to wait. You know, we got to do something now. And he just does a single hand consecration. St. Eusebius then shows up in Antioch and he's like, What have you done, Luciferus? Now we can't re re reconcile all the, all the groups together. And at that point, St. Eusebius is like, Well, I guess I got to go in, commune with Paulinus. And then at that point, Roman Alexander recognized the single hand consecration of Paulinus. But then they simply just treat St. Melitius as St. Basil as, as no better than a schismatic and heretic. And they so don't treat. The, the moral of this story is that in the end, as much as we may even sound, and I don't, I don't think we've sounded totally disrespectful to anyone except possibly Archbishop Lazar, for my apologies, um, but all of these people are innocent of the crimes, uh, the wrongdoings canonically against them because of the fact that they were trying to struggle against ecumenism. And the ecumenists created the situation, just like the Arians created the situation in the fourth century. Well, it was in the, in the it was in the interest of the Arians to create schisms and breaks among the Orthodox. Theory. And that's exact. And that's the same exact thing is happening now. Um, and this is something that 
is so, to make very clear whether I like or respect or disrespect any of the bishops I'm referring to, I have no doubt that they are all Orthodox in faith. I have no problem going to any of them under any circumstances, but we have our own synod and we're very happy with it and proud in Christ that it exists. Well, well let's let's also be very clear. Uh, let me, I don't know if I'm going to disagree with you here, Father Joseph. No, no, no please, okay. go ahead. Okay, but the point is, is that if you're part of a church, a synod, you have to abide by the guidelines of that synod. So you may think, well, maybe we should do this. We should have interaction with this other group, whatever. But if our synod says our position is that we do not regard uh, the Kalinica synod to be a valid synod, and if the Kalinica synod says the same thing about us, which I'm sure they do, um, then, you know, that's simply that's the our, position that, of the synod. That, yeah, we're, and, we're and, and people more. cannot get angry and say, well, how dare you do that? Well, then you say the same. It's like, you know, um, tit for tat. I hate to use the word not tit for tat. But it's, it's this, there's this idea that people have that everybody should recognize Synod B A as the valid Synod because obviously it's the most obvious choice because of how many people they had or how big they are or whatever, all right? But is that really a proper way to determine whether a Synod or a Bishop is canonical to begin with? No, you have to go by obedience to the canons. Yeah. And, and secondly, and secondly, I'm, I, I, the other point is that you do actually have legitimately deposed people yeah. uh, who were who two Orthodox bishops. I mean, for example, um, I think I see Gregory of Colorado is legitimately deposed. I mean, I don't think anybody can dispute that at this point. Well, he um, would argue that there he would argue that there weren't enough bishops. But oh. the point is, um, the basic, the, but they basically handed him over to deposition, which we've talked about before. In other words, that effectively, you know, I mean, he can have a retrial. <laughs> yeah, but he, he could ask for one. I don't think he'll get one. But then it's just either confirmation or a or a vindication or exoneration is what all it turns out to be. But right. the point is that, you know, in the end, all of this um, comes from the fact that all, all of these people were trying to struggle against ecumenism. And yes, there were personal failings in them. Um, that's, not, that's not going away. There's personal failings in all of us. But the simple reality is that, you know, the heretics created a situation that made it difficult. It was, you know, there's, I can't see how one could say, for example, um, argue uh, that, say, a bishop from Artok or a bishop from Roak is in the wrong because of some, you know, some hullabaloo in the Synod building that occurred in, you know, 1994, when I look and I see, you know, the Patriarch of Constantinople's deacons commemorating the Pope, I mean, they're not comparable. And so I think if a person is holding back from, you know, being true Orthodox because of our personal failings, and we're the ones willing to admit them, then I think that that's a, a huge mistake. Well, um, it's only, uh, let, let's also be frank, Father, just, is there any other any other synod that's going to have people that actually is going, trying to, I mean, are we the only people that are part of a synod that's willing to be fair, to try to be fair to everybody? I don't think, I think that, again... Because a lot of them have, they don't want to be fair. They want to basically pretend... Uh, they want to pretend uh, that you know 1994 to 2006 never existed, for example, or something yeah, like that. Well, and, that, and that's that's one of the big problems is that everyone kind of you know applies bygones selectively. Um, you know, and if you say this, you're a heretic. If you try to question their position, that, for example, my point is that um, here's what I've never had a sufficient explanation for that I thought is actually reasonable. I can understand condemning Kipriyanism and saying it's wrong and that from now on no one can hold this view, etc. I understand that. I agree with that. Okay, But I cannot understand the position that you can say Rokor was a true church from at least 94 to 2001 until Vitaly leaves, but it was in communion with public, open, condemned, and deposed heretics as they claim the Kipriyanites were. Because if that's the case and all the Rokor bishops read all of his theological documents in Russian and in English, and, and they voted to communion with him. It would naturally follow that. Then that it would, would wouldn't that fall upon him? Yeah. And but the, but then again, people want to pretend, you know, for their own reasons and various of them that that they want to ignore that that period and just treat as if it never happened or say. And most they'll say it was a mistake. But are you like mistakenly in communion with heretics for seven, eight, nine years after reading all their documents and being in constant, not just like occasional, but constant contact with them on a regular basis? I mean, that's. That's the, to me, uh, people end up shooting themselves in the foot, if you know what I mean. Well, like they're like they're sawing the branch off that they're on the other end of. 
it, it's inconsistency is what it basically comes down to. Yeah, but there's a no, no willingness to admit the inconsistency or come up with any that's kind the, of... And that's the ultimate problem, is that if you admit your inconsistency, you're in a better position because you're being honest. But uh, I think too few people realize that. And I mean, we had we had met one of Logius, who basically got, like, in the 2000s, we had to deal with all kinds of crap. I'm sorry, stuff from him, you know? <laughs> it was... It, and the yeah, whole I mean, Senate, basically, I mean, people always... Everything they bring up against us has always been... Well, if Logius did... If Logius, pardon me? No, I said I wasn't gonna say it wasn't gonna say the you know crap, but I, I went with faggotry instead. Oh well, it wasn't that wasn't the stuff. We it wasn't with. that. No, yeah, I was. Well, my point my point was is uh, you know, uh, the whole synod, especially our American bishops, had to like when he I don't know if he was I don't I don't I don't say he's losing his mind, but he basically began to basically make more and more bad decisions, and we had to at one point in two thousand one say, look, we're going to regard you as simply no longer the head of the church of our church if you don't stop this. All right, it was two thousand three actually. I'm sorry. And that was when the whole thing with the whole Syrians and all that other that all this stuff. Yeah, that, you know? yeah, and that actually almost led to our bishops breaking communion. Yeah, and that's what we told him. We said, "Look, and Luis, unless you renounce this and you and you apologize for this and stop this, we're we're done with you." Yeah. Right? But we were not, as a whole, willing to break everything up unless it was the like we were not willing to break unless there was no other choice because we didn't want to be like one of these other groups that simply gets in a big fight and then they form two or three other synods, all yeah, right? Exactly. And, and people were, I think, upset that we didn't do that. I think that's actually what they were uh, somewhat upset about. Or they claim that. They actually have other reasons for just to ignore or resist. Now, I and, and, and eventually, you know, we, we had our own autonomy granted to us as the Western, as the North American branch. Yeah. Yes, and at that point, uh, we were, a, you know, Evlogius, again, went down on his... Uh, at that point, Evlogius no longer had to rely on us or had, had no longer controlling reins, if you know what, if you know what I mean. From yeah, us. We have a we have and a basically left Irenaeus that I agree with you both about this. He we're in communion with uh, obviously his synod. Is this Bishop or, Irenaeus? Yeah, Bishop okay. Irenaeus okay. Said that. And then um, you know, thank you, thank you, Despota. And uh, then Jordan Brown says, Are there any talks between synods about resolving the issues between them? And if not, what would it take for them to do so? And I think we could probably close out the show answering this question. Uh, I I I hear things from people saying that they're they're back there behind the scenes talks and such. But the problem is with that is it may may be going on, but is it going to result? I mean, I hope it results. I think the problem is that everyone does things behind the scenes. Um, and you can't, but if you do it publicly, people are afraid of that. If if you have a public, are afraid a public, of losing face. Of course, because if somebody has a public uh, dialogue for reunion the conference. Then you, then they feel that they're having, you're giving some kind of public um, recognition or, or legitimacy to somebody. So they feel the best way to, because they, their view might be, what if everything goes wrong and we don't want to legitimize these guys or whatever that's supposed to mean, and uh, therefore they, their view is to do it behind the scenes, right? Well, also, there's and there's also the jurisdictional issue which comes into play as well. Um, for example, uh, members of one synod have uh, mentioned talking to our synod. Um, you know, in terms of possible discussion of reunion, but they're a Greek synod, and we're in communion with a Greek synod, so they should be talking to them, not yeah. us. I mean, every time someone contacts, I say go to go to Evlona if you're a Greek yeah, synod. Go to Evlona or go to go to Metropolitan Seraphim in Russia. You know, the point is do it through the right people. Um, well, they, but, but, but however, the, there's a reason some of them come to us because they want to try to break us off and incorporate them into their organization. That that's actually a reason some people would go to a one, only one group of a wider communion, because they're not really necessarily interested. And in, um, I, this I hate to be I hate to be I hate to be um, uh, negative, but I this is how I see things happening with many of these many of these organizations and synods. Their view is that can we break so and so organization or some of their clergy off? Yeah, like it's a chief stealing. You know. Yeah, and, I mean, yeah, yeah and, and, rivalry. And, and, I'm not. I'm not going to lie there. And on one uh, hand, we'll get upset if we don't call them true orthodox. But on the other hand, if we call them true orthodox, they'll be like, "Oh, you see, they believe in all calendar humanism." You know, the the, the, the yeah, that, 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 that's the most. So we're thing. darned if we do, we're darned if we don't, no matter what we say. Yeah, the concept of all calendar humanism is is such a bad concept. I really don't even. I, I, I mean, it's I, ahistorical. You'd have to say that. You'd have to say that St. Athanasius talking to St. Basil when they weren't in communion and they had the mutual condemnations of their of, among their bishops would be there would be ecumenism. I mean, who would who would claim who would claim that? You know? Yeah, it's, it's ecumenism of all the Orthodox. It, it, it's a stupid. Which thing. is not ecumenism. All right, now, <laughs> suffering Orthodoxy says, "I'm new to your channel. What church and jurisdiction do you belong to?" We belong to the Autonomous Metropolitan of North and South America and the British Isles, which is a mouthful. 
And uh, we were with the Avlona Synod and the yeah. Russian Orthodox Synod of Metropolitan Under, under Metropolitan Seraphim, and we were originally part of the Milan Synod and were granted autonomy in 2011. Uh, Jordan Brown says, please finish discussing your synod first, though, if you weren't done doing so. Um, well, I, I mean, I think we, we covered it. Basically, our biggest, our biggest thing, to be quite honest, is just doing things right by the canons. And so, you know, to me, that is the ultimate definition of what canonical is. If you're willing to put the canons first, even when it doesn't benefit you, then that is canonicity. Because if you're, you know, if the canons are worthless to you in practice, but then you like saying, well, we've got all these pretty buildings, you've lost the plot. You've missed the point. Um, so that's where, that's my, that's my take on it. I mean, as a synod, I, I, I saw I, the concept was a sort of logius, basically in this few year period, went around to different patriarchs trying to propose some sort of anti-ecumenical union. Yeah. I mean, it was, whole, it was the whole thing was kind of, uh, how do you say, uh, kind of a pipe dream. Yeah, it, and, was, it, uh, was, it was dumb. And and, and, Archer, and then Archer John said, look, this is ridiculous. Even if we went along with this, and it was and if, even if this even happened, are we going to have to set on SCOBA? That, that would be the end of us. You know, we're going to have to – I mean, we would how we not can celebrate with anybody because we wouldn't consider them orthodox, you know? Uh, and so basically if Logius kind of got upset with us and we kind of – around 2004, he kind of stopped um, because basically we were going to, you know, frankly depose him. And, um, you know, he kind of, you know, I, I, I'm not, I, I don't mean he, the man has died. God has, you know, that's all already God, happened. God rest his soul. Yeah, and, so, and the so, truth is in those last years, we don't even know who was controlled. Well, what happens is, of course, um, now we eventually, we eventually did have him sign documents saying that he was, you know, basically being more strict and resigned. I mean, we have it somewhere on the, 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 what's in a web, the website or something like that about, you know, clarifying, you know, his, his past errors and things, you know. Which the Senate had basically essentially censured him for, and was like de facto. There was almost this fractured communion of, uh, almost happening. Yeah. So uh, then, of course, so that's basically what happens. And then we're granted autonomy by Milan in 2011. We work out an agreement, um, and you know we have our bishops made in the United States. You know, so and then of course after that period, um, even um, I mentioned one of Logius under the. Uh, doleful or, I don't know if that's the word, bad, baneful influence of a uh, Romanian uh, man he took in and made a priest and then a bishop, um, begins to influence him again to basically say, oh, well, you know, everything, you're, he's basically a, a confronting an old man and saying, essentially, your whole life work is going to fall apart, you know, nothing's going to happen, you need to go back, you need to join the Moscow Patriarchate, and he convinces Logis like to break communion with all of us, um, and you know we kind of reciprocate. We just acknowledge, just no, we're not in communion, and so does so does Avlona. We we were we did discover some things about his life. So. Yes, well, not not of Logius' life, but this Romanian. No, not of Logius about no. the, the yeah. yeah well, I won't. Well, yeah, exactly. So what happens is that they eventually have this dialogue with the Moscow Patriarch when they're just totally separated from everybody, and they like give all their churches away. They retired completely, give away all the churches, <laughs> and then the Moscow Patriarch is like, "Well, we got all your property. We don't need you." Uh, and then, you know, at that point, if Logius is like an old man, been, he's been led down the garden path by this guy. And, uh, oh, he's doing his for him. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I'm not, I don't have any, any mad negatives. In fact, we never had any negative ill feeling toward him. We just thought he was making bad decisions. We had to cause, we had to quote unquote cause problems. I mean, that's what you're supposed to do in the Synod. You're supposed to actually make the first hierarch or the other bishops behave if they're actually misbehaving. Um, but, um, and then, you know, from his perspective, he basically uh, a few years later claimed to be a bishop again, and he claimed. Um, and and at that point, uh, none of us. I know from inside people who were actually uh, made one man who was made a, a priest by this uh, Romanian bishop that was under Vlogius. Um, that uh, Vlogius during this period, like 2016, all the rest, he wasn't even mentally there. Yeah, he was. Uh, just he had, he, they had sometimes he was, and they gave him medicine. He could do liturgy on a few occasions, that kind of stuff. And so it was just a sad, tragic case. Um, and and basically, when we went back in, in communion with Avlona, Avlona had already worked out some agreement with with ostensibly Vlogius. And uh, you know, we were like, well, look, we'll be in communion with Metropolitan Angelos and his synod, but we at this point we just cannot deal with um, ostensibly what is said to be Milan at this point. Yeah, and, um, and in the end, basically, most of. Yes. Any, then after Mitch one of Logis died, everybody else kind of withdrew from this Bishop of Bundius anyway. Yeah, and so, you because know, basically... A lot of, it, a lot of, a lot of Greek old calendar bishops have personal allegiances, if you know what I mean, to have Logis helping them do things. 
Yeah. And so the concept is kind of like, well, you know, we don't want to publicly attack him anymore. If his mind is going, he's not fully there. Um, I don't know, lack of a better word uh, to say about it. You know, um, yeah, God it, rest it, his soul. I mean, I, I do pray for him. Uh, and, you know, you know, it was just a, it was a sad situation to happen and to uh, transpire. Uh, but I think it, it illustrates what happens if you don't have people uh, immediately around you who are reliable in a, pos in a in a positive direction, if you know what I mean. Now, uh, a few more comments really quick. Bishop Irenaeus says, old calendar ecumenism is a made up thing. Thank you, I agree. It has no meaning. Suffering Orthodoxy asks, is the True Orthodox Directory Online up to date? The answer to that question nope. is honestly no. no. Um, the best thing you're, you can do if you're looking at different True Orthodox jurisdictions is look at their own directories. They update their own directories uh, pretty regularly. Um, you know, in our directory, we update regularly. So the point is, um, that's the best advice uh, I can give. Um, we've now gone two hours and 40 minutes, um, Father. So I think... So again, again, what, what, what we would say to you know, jurisdictional Royal Rumble, whatever, is uh, we have our own preference. Our preference is if somebody wants to join Orthodoxy, we would suggest them either join our Synod or the Avlona Synod we're in communion with. They're basically the, our only two Synods in communion with each other. Uh, that are in the country. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, we could say raw Russian church, but they're basically in Russia. It's not really going to be a, an issue. Um, and uh, that's, we have our own own views and perspectives, on what, and I think we've kind of enunciated those. Uh, yeah, I think we've definitely done that over the past two and a half plus yes. hours. Uh, now, the, the problem is people wish to pretend uh, all this history did not transpire, or they wish to pretend that one party or one jurisdiction has uniquely among the true orthodox has uniquely apostatized or done evil to such an extent that no one could accept them all right and it, what happens is that oftentimes you may have jurisdictions that, let's say they may not like us and some of them will gang up on us to say well we all don't like each other but we can all agree we don't like you you know we, but then but we, then they turn but then they eventually once they're th then eventually they do turn on each other after enough time yeah, what it is is ultimately this. We are all going to be, if the end is not near, judged by history. And so that is something that we should keep in mind, uh, no matter what synod we are in. Um, and Jordan Brown asks, last question for me, what's the situation with Archbishop Anufrius of Bergamo? Um, I can tell you. Huh? Uh, we originally had voted to try to repair the situation with Archbishop Anufrius, uh, but no action was further taken after that. And we have we are currently not in any communion with him. That's the actual situation. Yeah. The, now he's an interesting uh, part of the whole discussion with the collapse of the Milan Synod because when Metropolitan of Logius um, if formally quit, Metropolitan Anufrius kind of took over, for lack of a better word. But he got some of the legal didn't. titles and things. Yeah, the legal titles. He didn't get the Lazaretto, obviously, yeah. but the point is. Um, you know, he tried to he tried to and still tries to maintain and, things. And initially, Metropolitan John Arson gave him a Tomos to recognize him. Yeah, we but, and we, we you know we we did but, recognize him. The problems began, but then there. I mean, I, not to get too much into it, but there began to be problems uh, with you know basically certain parishes he took in in Romania and how they did the liturgical practices and such. He um, took in a former bishop of our Russian synod and declared a Metropolitan of America. Yeah, I mean that was the, yes, exactly. That was the whole the whole Nicholas oh, Uhoh things. And so basically, in then in 2016, uh, we were like, well, we can repair the situation, um, but ultimately it never really got fixed. But uh, we're, that doesn't mean we're not trying. Well, we, yes. I mean, we well, haven't, but, I haven't given up on, on Metropolitan Anufrius. Metropolitan Anufrius, no. yeah, no, I, I don't have no... no he's, certainly not in the, he's certainly not in the position of Metropolitan of Logios was. Yeah, I mean, the question is, uh, who's, is, is we would like to fix any situation, but there are certain issues in the background that, are, that I won't get involved into right now. They're not moral issues or attacks. Yeah, no, he's not. He, yeah, that, he's, you know, he, there are certain know, issues that have to be dealt with, and until they're dealt with, it just we just cannot the situation cannot we we can't have a communion at this point and um that, that ultimately means we're going to have to send somebody to italy i mean i know much one has made he doesn't like our communion with avlona and that's caused issues i won't get into any more so you know it's it, that's 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 that kind of thing going on and so yeah it's that's it's internecine dispute that's big but we're you know, we are working on it yeah. um it's a perpetual project yeah that's basically, 
Yeah, that's a, that's a good way of putting it, Father. Yeah. Okay. Well, with that, I hope that uh, we've answered as many questions uh, to anyone offended. I apologize, but um, to well, anyone, why would anyone be offended? Everyone, uh, you know, everyone says know. everything. You, know, you never know. I we just, tried to be as fair we could as we could to all these different. Yeah, things. but you know, people be like, "Those are partisan hacks." Now, you know, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I, we tried, we did our best, but you know, again, when you're talking about a situation this large and spanning this much time people are going to have opinions and especially people who might have been intimately involved in this or that side or whatever. And they may feel that we're, you know, just idiots talking, you know, out of the side of our mouths. So, you know, I think we've got the history, right? I'm fairly confident about that, but people are going to have opinions. So that's, so that was, it was more of a generic, I'm sorry, not like a, I'm personally sorry they're blank or whoever, you know, it's just, um, but, um, Hopefully I mean, I, I'm, I'm, it's always kind of irritating when people, you know, say, how dare you say these things against us when they've said basically the exact same things against us. Yeah, or they've said worse. Or, it generally worse, yes. When yeah, we're trying, I mean, I we, we generally try to be restrained and fair and even, you know, quote unquote neutral. And you, what you find out is that nobody or a lot of your uh, uh, enemies have no desire to be fair. Yeah. And uh, they are willing to accuse you of things that they and their their jurisdiction, in fact, did, although they don't talk a lot about it. Yeah, we're actually trying to be honest. We're with trying this. to put everything on the table. Yeah, and uh, and however, that's unfortunately a tactic with some people in these true Orthodox jurisdictions, where they hold things back about their own history, what what their archbishop so and so did, and Mitropolitan so and so did, so they can later s claim a superiority, if you know what I mean, of yeah. cleanness. To, to use a term you used earlier, that only this guy, this group is clean, to yeah. lord it over other people. And then after you join them, after a few years, you find out what happened, but then guess what? It's too late. Well, you know, I will say this. Um, there have been a few cases, and I can think of at least one bishop um, who learned through the process and realized, you know, that there you you can there could be disingenuity and dishonesty what? and so Bishop Moses? Yeah, I was thinking, you know, he eventually figured out of, he was um, Hock, you know, old Hockna. He was uh, he was Hockna, and then he went to you know the Clinico Synod, but he even made note of our autonomy um, because he knew that Hockna's autonomy was a sham. Although he and, got in trouble with that, and he had to make a little side note later. Well, yeah, but the, the point is the essay stayed the same, so yeah. I, I give him respect for that because there are younger bishops who may not have the, I guess you would say, historical baggage that some of the older bishops do, and so you know. Well, that's what happened. Once everyone has kind of reposed of that generation, and then the next generation that was taught by them, there's less and less of a. Um, there's less uh, hostility. Yes. So people are more more than willing to find uh, to to use a much abused term to use economy in a situation uh, if it's solved in the tr in a, a direction that's consistent with the Orthodox Confession of Faith. And that's the way it's always happened. Whether the fourth century, the after the iconoclast heresy. Or tomorrow. Well, the Iconoclast heresy was even worse because at the, at the Seventh Ecumenical Council, the discussion was how to receive all these bishops who had none of them had Orthodox ordinations or even baptisms. You know? But I can guarantee, you know, anyway, not, not to get into that. Situation. Yeah, I was like, I don't know if we want to cover that in this episode. Yeah. Um, all right. But in any case, thank you everyone for listening. Um, you know, again, for your patience. Uh, especially, I, I give a shout out to my long suffering wife who I. You know, do these broadcasts get longer? Anyway, um, so thank you to everyone listening, everyone there. Thanks to Father Enoch's dogs for not, you know, being too angry. And uh, I think we covered we covered everything as well as we could, Father. I'm sure we'll have more comments about what we can cover in the next episode. Yeah, good. and then uh, you know we'll talk. Uh, we'll, we'll have, I'm sure we'll talk about it again, and then we'll do some uh, some more more apologetics next time. All right. Okay. Have a good night, all. Benedicite. Benedicite.